Hey, can we, yeah, can give, it, give a hand for PJ. Where is he? Come on, man. There's more anointing in that beard than a lot of places in the world. Um, hey, can we put the phone number back on the screen? But it doesn't have to be fancy. Can you just make it big so everybody can see it? If that's possible. That's not Dan's number, by the way, so don't be giving that number away. <laughs> uh, but really, before we start, uh, guys, I just want to encourage you that this is, this, is, uh, this is what I've been looking forward to, just Q&A. I feel like this is just like family time where we could sit down and really chew on things together. And I just want to encourage you to check your heart before you ask a question. Because I don't, I don't think asking questions are bad, but as long as they come from the right heart posture. And we're not questioning God tonight. We're questioning things that we can learn about him, learn about his nature, learn about who we are in him. So I just, I don't know, I just wanted to say that, that, I, that I don't want him to come out of bitterness or pain, just, just let it come out of a real pure place because I don't want to put God on trial tonight, that's not the key of this, is we just want to ask and, and receive truth and be set free, amen? Amen. Okay, so let's do this, let's get one live audience question, who wants to, can I, can I say something oh yeah, yeah. That? Just on the heels of what Joey just said, it's so, it's so profound what he just said. See, if your heart pure, isn't pure in when you're asking, you're asking out bitterness or out on trial or because of a pain or hurt or unresolved thing, it, 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 it affects your ability to hear. Jesus said, be careful how you hear. Sometimes you could say one thing and three people in the room can hear three different things. That's amazing. So be careful how you hear. You want to live in a pure place. You want to ask questions humbly, not contentiously, because it affects the way you hear. Are you following me? Jesus isn't threatened by your attitude, your questions, even if it's deceived. He is like amazingly secure. I'm personally, I love questions. I'm not threatened by questions either. I just want you to be able to hear clear, okay? So that's why it's important what he just said. And while I'm open here and, and talking, uh, really, let's look really strongly for questions that really relate to the things we've been ministering, preaching, that, that concern your identity, your destiny, your, 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 your walking out faith. Don't just dig in for some deep theological question and, and, and Revelation questions, book of Revelations, I'd, I'd ask you to probably avoid that tonight. I think that could get distract us from where we're at. And I'm just asking you probably not to go there. It just feels right in my heart. Okay? All right. Amen. Question. Okay, so all you have to do is just raise your hand. Okay. Who, Christoph, do we have a mic? Is there a mic we can run around real quick? If not, I can jump. That's fine. We'll jump into a phone question. Uh, I saw this guy on the end first, so make sure we get him a mic. But we'll go ahead and get do a phone question real quick. Oh, yeah, here you go. <laughs> hey, Dan. Hey, buddy. <laughs> so uh, one of my best friends, he recently um, lost his brother. He was my age, 27, to cancer. And he's, he's a guy that struggles with, definitely with faith. His mom believes, his sister believes, but he's kind of a stunt double rock star, kind of Hollywood type life. But, you know... It's one of those things that, um, you know, we, we know that that's not God that did that. We know that, and, and we all know that, and I know that. But the fact that he doesn't, he has to blame something. And it's just something I've struggled with is answering some of these questions that he has and that, you know, it was his best friend. He loses his brother, and then he's, you know, he's questioning, like, you know, okay, why, why would... Why would, you know, why would God do that? And I was like, that wasn't God. It's just not him. He's the giver of life. He's the giver of love. Um, and I, I watched a sermon on you giving that God receives them. He doesn't take. But his question was, well, he still didn't intervene to stop it. And I just don't know how to answer those questions like that. I get that question a lot. People go, well, he didn't intervene and stop it. So he's not there for him. Okay. You guys hear the question? Could you hear? Okay because the sound I was trying to really catch. This is a great question. That's a question that's asked. Your question's great. There's a question that's asked from people a lot. Well, why didn't he stop it? Uh, we have to understand something. Psalm says he gave the earth to the children of men. You know, he told us not to live in fear. He told us to study and show ourselves approved. There's a lot of people out there that call on God in a case of emergency. They're trying to build a house in a storm and all kinds of things are happening. Some of us are still trying to get over fear and just find the right motive even in prayer. Uh, and then when things don't happen, we want to immediately get tricked into pointing to God. And, and I promise you, that's the enemy. He's the accuser of the brethren to God, and he's the accuser of God to the brethren. He, like, switches it back and forth. And I've noticed that when people get frustrated and, and, and offended or hurt, it reveals something that they don't have an understanding of covenant and communion with God. 
They actually just are expecting God to sit at some big mystical desk of administration, call the shots, and anything that happens is Him. And it's not like that at all. Men are being destroyed for the lack of knowledge. The power of death and life is in our tongues. Yeah? He said we reap what we sow. He told us to never fear, and some of us live in fear. And don't address it and get a grip on it and find a freedom in it, you know, from it. And, and I'm just telling you, there's a lot of things like that that are going on. And somehow the fall of man has a rational wisdom to rest it on God and accuse him in their mind. That's a sure sign to us as believers it's never God. To answer your question and talk to him personally, I, I usually try to address the goodness of God and I bring the cross into it. I've learned this in my Bible that they asked Jesus a lot of questions from wrong places. Who would agree? Like they had motives to trap him, trick him. But here's what you'll find. If you look... Jesus never answered their question. He always responded with the question. Whenever they asked Jesus a question from a wrong place, he said, let me ask you a question. Or who of you? And he always flipped it and asked them a question. And what he was doing was he wasn't catering to their heart. Remember how in front of Pilate and they were accusing him of stuff and he never said a word and Pilate said, these men are accusing you and you're saying nothing? It's because he wasn't going to get in the place of defending himself when he knew how far out there their hearts were. He wasn't going to speak into the air, into nothing, and actually help fortify the problem. So when people say, well, if God is good, then how come he let my brother die? And I say, well, let me ask you a question, because sometimes I think we ask the wrong question in our hurt and our pain and our real loss. If God wasn't good, why did he send his son when we're all yet sinners? See, if you question the nature of God through loss, you're going to be deceived and get a wrong view of God. If you question the nature of God through His love, through sending His Son while we were yet sinners, you're going to keep God in His right perspective. It's going to birth a diligence and a stewardship to live the kingdom gospel. Begin to study, show yourself approved. Take some accountability, stewardship, responsibility, if you will, in your life, calling, and destiny. And start going after Him instead of just blaming Him. I assure you this. He said, unless you love less, all those things on the list... Your mother, your father, your wife, your children, your house, and your lands. Don't think your siblings and all that stuff isn't in that list. It's everything dear and intimate to us in the emotions and the sentiment life. He said, unless you love all those things less, you'll by no means be my disciple. What he's trying to say is, guys, I'm not here making your world go the way you hope. I've given you a stewardship of the world through my great name, and I want to reveal myself through you. And unless you love all those things you're sentimental towards, you will never fulfill why you're here because you'll let those things stumble your heart and maybe even misread me. And that's how I explain it to people. And I really believe a wrong view of God is a tragic thing right now on the earth that in presumption really quick people don't even think of God for weeks and months and years a bad thing happens and now they're mad at God and why did he let that happen and they haven't even considered him for a year but all of a sudden he's in their thoughts when there's loss you see what I mean we've been set up by the enemy to believe he's at a desk of administration calling the shots and that somehow he's sitting there flagrantly watching and whistling letting things happen no, he gave the earth to the children of men. We have a stewardship of life. You and me are called to guard our own heart, for out of our hearts flows the issues of life. But because we don't guard our heart, we have snap judgments, offense, animosity, and even accusations towards God. Are you following me? So when I was, when I was saved, I realized, I realized that, you know what? I can't lose this thing now. And this happened in my heart. And I wasn't throwing my family away. I said, man, I could lose my wife. I could lose my children, I could lose my home, but I can't lose. I'm in, I understand why I'm alive, and I'm called to shine, come hell or high water. No matter what, I'm called to live Him. And I taught that in my home group one day, and I was so passionate, I tore the buttons off a shirt like this. I said, you can't touch me now, and the buttons were popping, and people were looking, and they were like, dude, I don't think we came to hear this sermon. Because most of us are Christians for the protection of those things. So wonder if we lose something, how do you respond? Are you following me? And you've got to make sure that you don't let something matter more than what matters most. Is there physical loss? Absolutely. Are we being insensitive to him losing a brother and making light of it? Absolutely not. It's a very hard thing and it's real and it's physical loss. But Paul said we don't grieve as those who have no hope. And as soon as you accuse the only one that's truly good, now you're in a desolate dry place. Are you following me? Come on, man. If he wasn't good, why'd he send his son? 
Listen, I've prayed for the sick and haven't seen them healed. It doesn't change the gospel. I open the book and Jesus' life's the same. His promises are the same. I could pray for 16 people with cancer and they die. And I'm still supposed to pray for the sick. So if you see number 17, don't just back off and say, well, I'm running a pretty bad record. I'm over 16. I think I ought to just quit. No, you got to pursue and press in and go after it in your personal faith and life, right? So pray for number 17. Don't tell them you're over 16. <laughs> it doesn't help. Just pray for the sick. Don't get, don't get... Don't come up with spiritual analogy, analogies to try to comfort your troubled heart. Because most of the time, that's at the cost of truth, and truth's what makes you free. Are you guys with me? So we, here's what we tend to do. We look at life, and this is, you could talk to him about this. We look at life and see how it unfolds and then define God through the unfolding. We're supposed to already know who God is through his son. We're not finding God along the way. We find Him through His Son. When you see His Son, you've seen the Father. No one's seen the Father at any time, yet He's declared Himself through His Son. Yeah? In former days, He spoke to the fathers through the prophets. In these last days, He has spoken through His Son, who is the outraying of His brightness and the expressed image of His person. Philip, how is it you ask me to show you the Father? Have you been with me so long and still you don't know when you've seen me? You've already seen him. I only do the will of him who sent me. I only do what I see him do, only say or hear what I see, or hear him say, or say what I hear him say. When you see Jesus' life, you see the Father revealed. So if you can't find in your experience the life of Jesus and his outcome, then don't call it the will of the Father. Let's go after that thing and expect it to change. There's not a Christian on the earth, I don't care what denomination you are, that you can walk to and say this to and get a different answer. There's not one Christian that would answer this different. You say, if Jesus walked in the room and touched your sick loved one, what would happen? Nobody would hesitate. I don't care what denomination you are. You ask that question, they would say, well, they'd be healed. And yet he's in us and we're the expression, the body of Christ. And as he is, so are we in this world. And the things I do, you'll do if you believe. Now just hear me on this. If you were the enemy and everything was promised to the believer, what would your, be your main target of attack? The belief system of the body of Christ. And you'd get us to fight over things that are revealed through his life, but are contrary to our experience. And then we internalize loss. We get offended. Guys, John the Baptist preached and announced Jesus in. He, from the Lord, had a revelation that he was the Lamb of God and the Son of God. And there's no one on the earth that knew more who he was than John. Agreed, scripturally? And yet, when he was in prison, he asked his disciples to go ask Jesus a question he already knew the answer to. Why did he ask the question? Because of his own personal situation. You know that's true by Jesus' answer. He said, go ask him if he's the one or should we look for another? John asked that question. John said, he's the one. The Lord showed me the one that the Spirit comes upon and rests upon and remains upon. He's the one. I must decrease. He must increase. Follow him. Now he's in prison and he's asking a question. Hey, are you really the one or should we be looking around? Because by the looks of my life, you don't look like you're the one. And Jesus said, you go back and tell John what you both see and hear. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is the man who's not offended because of me. You be honest, when we have close loss in our lives, the first thing people do, especially if they're not strong believers, but even if they're believers, they get offended at God. Which means they've never had a relationship with him. They have an expectation of him. They don't have a covenant understanding. They have a need of him. And they'll quickly write him off in the face of loss because they internalize the loss because the loss is closer than him. I'm just talking to you. I hope I'm making sense. Cindy's back there just going like this like crazy. I don't know if somebody needs to. I just see her and I'm not the one letting people did ask you, questions. Did you have I'm a question kinda, real quick? 
I think it's in response to it. It's obviously connected. Hi, Dan. Hey, it's kind of a follow-up question, but we're just so grateful you're here, and we appreciate you so much. You, can you hear me? You, can you hear her? Really good? Can, I don't can know you if hear it's me? where I'm sitting. Or? Yeah. Can we I just turn up we maybe appreciate the, you. I <laughs> it's just like I'm just not here. When he was talking, it was so hard for me to understand what he was saying. I'm just sitting in a place I guess I'm not hearing. No, it's not the mic. It sounds right like mic. mumble to me. Hello, there it is. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to listen closely. Can you hear me? Go ahead. I said thank you for being here. We really appreciate you coming. Amen. And also, and also, I don't think you have to go out and do your 10-mile run tomorrow. I saw you tonight. <laughs> okay. So this is kind of a follow-up to his question is because... I hear people say that the Bible says that our days are numbered and God knows the number of our days and, you know, those verses. Okay. So how do you um, answer to it's that? Very, like very this, simple. I can answer. Especially Cindy. when a, like a seven-year-old dies in a I car accident. No, it's a good question. Listen, God's omniscient. He knows the beginning from the end. So he, he knows the number of our days because he sees the beginning and the end. It doesn't mean he personally numbered our days. It says it's appointed once for every man to die. It doesn't say there's an appointed time for every man to die. There's a big difference. We say, hey, when your time card's punched, buddy, you're out of here. There's no time card. The Bible says you can lengthen your days, shorten your days. We're in a war. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Honor your mother and father. It will be well with you, and life will be long. Set your love upon him. He'll show you his salvation, and with long life satisfy you. There's so many promises that show that you don't have a set time. It's appointed once for every man to die. It doesn't say there's an appointed time for every man to die. Come on. Huge difference. He's not the orchestrator of death, people. He's the author and giver of life. God can will life, and you speak death, and step into death, and the whole time he's willing life, and you reap what you sowed, and your words have snared you. In your mouth is the power of death and life. Why did he give you that kind of authority and power if everything that happens is him? People are destroyed for the lack of knowledge, not the sovereign administrative choice of God. So let's get the knowledge and stop destruction. Sometimes he tells us to not fear and use the power of his name, and we fear and question his name. And then things fall apart, and now we really have issues. I'm just saying, I'm not putting any one thing on any one person. Don't get condemned by this. Be humbled by this. It's too easy in the fall of man, in the mindset of the pride of man, to accuse God for the clay to rise up and find fault with the potter. That's scary to me. I don't even want to have a belief system that allows me to be mad at God for a minute. That tells me I'm gravely deceived. He doesn't owe me anything. He gave me life. And it's a gift. And yet he gives me all things through him. You get what I'm saying? He is good. He's our friend. He's our father. And a right view of God would be amazing. And if we would lose somebody in our life. See, I teach this stuff, man. I just had a friend that I've been getting to know good and hung out with now for several years in a row, once a year and spent some time with, who loves me and loves the teaching. And he's 41 maybe. And, and it was just about three weeks ago. He's in his jacuzzi tub crying out for people, mentioning their names for deliverance and prayer and praying an increase and God open their heart and minister and show your mercy. And he's just caring about people, man. His family's down there trying to have a cookout and they're laughing because dad's so loud. And, and they're just kind of like, oh my goodness, and the son goes and closes the door because they couldn't talk. And next thing you know, they hear him shift into God, I want more of you, God, I need you, God. This dude... Looks like you cut him out of stone. He is a, he is a fit, he's the most fit man I've probably ever met. And he's got endurance, and he's strong, and he absolutely loves the Lord. And he always said that he felt like your physical was directly connected to the health and strength of your spiritual. And he was just like, he was just spirit, soul, and body, just yay. They heard him get quiet. They thought, man, what happened? happened? She said, I need to go check on him and see if he's done, if he'll come down and eat or whatever. She walked in, he's face down in the tub and he's gone. He's like 41. 
leaders and people of the church come rushing. 911 came, their CPR, and they're praying for him to raise from the dead. He never rose from the dead. They buried him four days later. It doesn't even make sense, guys. It's the last person in my life that I would put on that list. He's the last one that I would think that would happen to. You talk about a holy man. You talk about a man that loved everybody he walked by and brought Jesus into the atmosphere. And then, if we're not careful, there's an American thing that could creep into the gospel. Well, that's what I get so mad about God. Like, that's a person like that. Why would he let, and why would he allow, and why would he? That is dangerous language. That is accusation. As if God's flagrantly sitting by making an administrative decision or dropping the ball. His son called me the next morning. The morning after, he was pronounced dead at night. They searched him and autopsied and ran all these, and never found a cause of death. His son stood up at his funeral and said, I just want to stand up and honor my dad. And I want to let you know my dad loved Jesus with all this heart and he was a living example to me. And because of him, I'm going to go on and bam, bam, bam. And he went on and he shared, and I'm watching the funeral. They sent me a link to the funeral. I'm just bawling. I mean, his daughter stood in the center of the worship team and led worship. You're a good, good God. Four days after he died, the daughter who just graduated this year, the son who's getting married in two months. We wrap so much sentiment around this thing that we can't even handle it. And them kids, kids, with a revelation of the nature of God, stood there and honored him in the face of losing their dad, understanding if it wasn't for God, they wouldn't even have a dad. If it wasn't for God, they wouldn't be here. And if it wasn't for the blood, they'd have no life. Come on. Come on. These are kids, man, to me, but they ain't kids. He called me and he said, Dan, I have questions. And I said, okay. Pastor, it, he got a hold of me, he texted me because I have this cell phone, see? <laughs> he texted me and, and I actually appreciate it, it's convenient, but he texted me and he's a friend of mine and he has my number and he texted me and, and he said, his son has questions and they love me and respect me, I'm a friend of their family and he said, can he please call you? I'm not sure how to answer him right now because my buddy, the pastor, was they were, they were best friends. He was shook up like I was. It hit me hard that he was dead. I was like, I couldn't comprehend it that he was gone. And his son called me and said, man, he had so many promises, so many visions, so many words from the Lord. He had so many things he shared with me that God was going to do, you know, with him and through him. And he just had vision, Dan, and None of it came to pass. Every promise seems gone now, and I don't understand. And I said, I don't understand either, and I'm not even going to try to answer. I don't understand. Your daddy's the last person I expected this to ever happen to, and I'm telling you, it, it astounds me. I don't understand, but here's what I do understand. This is where everything God has nurtured you in, taught you in, founded you in, everything you've pursued to believe and all all the things you've grown in faith in, this is the time where the rubber meets the road concerning your faith. And this is where you stand and reveal what you really believe and really understand in the face of difficult law. This is when the integrity of your faith is found and your relationship and intimacy with Jesus is revealed. And he said, I get it. I said, let me encourage you in something. Your daddy's, he's going right now and there's no way we can deny that. And the physical loss is real and you're going to cry at times. You're going to miss him horribly at times. You're going to lift your hands and thank God for some things. And thankfulness will get you through it. And I talked about that in detail. I'm rushing that part. And I said, but let me tell you something that's amazing. Today on this phone, you are no less a man of God, no less anointed, no less called of him, have no less destiny, and no less sphere of influence in the passing of your daddy. It's time to make sure Jesus is Lord in all things. And he just said, I get it, and I appreciate it, thank you. We prayed, hung up. I watched him in that funeral. He said, it's funny, the doctors couldn't find a cause of death. It's because my dad was already dead. It was amazing what he said. He said it, and he laughed. And he said, you don't understand. All he cared about was Jesus and being an example to his family, and bam, 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 and seeing a person and ministering and loving and praying. It's what he lived for. And he said, and if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, this would be lost and my dad's forever with him and all I can do is be thankful. Missing, yes, be thankful absolutely for the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a 19-year-old talking who knows his God. Yeah? Don't you get caught in sentiment and analytical thinking and rational things. 
Don't you surround yourself with people that understand pain and not understand the gospel. Don't you cry out your heart to people that would hurt worse than you. You'll get no good answer. You'll get sympathy and it won't help you. It'll empower you to be broken. Be careful. Okay. That's good. Hey, just to be real real quick. Um... Sorry, I don't give quick answers. This stuff's so important. It's so important because it keeps you from stumbling. One wrong belief. You hinge your life on one wrong belief. What a limitation. You get one wrong view of God. How stifling is that? Yeah? It's important to see. Go ahead. That's good. Uh, just to, for time's sake, I'm already maxed out for questions. I mean, I got, you guys are asking so many good questions. So uh, if you could, just don't send me anymore because I have like, uh, <laughs> I'm over 100 unread text messages right now. So, um, okay, next question. In the light of your teaching on identity and transformation, can you talk about the place of deliverance ministry, maybe where it fits, and as you hit on that, um, generational curses and how maybe that might tie in? Wow, yeah. Yeah, and when I answer, please, if you're in deliverance ministry, don't hear what I'm not saying and don't take things personal, okay? Uh, I think a lot of times in deliverance ministry, we have great intentions to help people. I know for sure a lot of deliverance ministries rose up out of the fact that we weren't seeing the results we were desiring, so we're trying to find more results. I'm a truth guy. I, I got a lot of testimonies. I actually, I actually interviewed and searched out a lot of different ministries for a five-year period just to really weigh results, to hear where their heart of faith was, because I, I was concerned. I'm in ministry. People were saying, hey, we ought to do this. We ought to bring this into the church. We ought to do this. And now it's such a widespread, you can't even use the term inner healing, it's not fair because it means 20 different things. It's just a big broad thing right now. Deliverance ministry, there's a place for casting out devils. There's a place where people get so bound they need freedom. It's, Jesus said, if I cast out spirits by the finger of God, surely the kingdom is upon you. He cast spirits out with a word. I personally don't entreat devils. I'm personally not a fan of talking to them. They're liars. Why would you? <laughs> I've seen people play with manifestations and put people through things for months on end thinking they're accomplishing something and they're entertaining evil spirits. Generational curses are real. You can track them in families. But once you become a believer, they're not relevant. You need to take authority and separate yourself from that bloodline and you need to make a strong declaration that you're no longer fit in that thing. And there's no way that the curse of forefathers can come through the blood of Jesus if you're righteous and cleansed of all sin and free. Don't think because your dad was an alcoholic, your great-granddad was an alcoholic, and his dad was an alcoholic, that you have to be an alcoholic. Don't say, well, I drink because they all drank. That's a good reason not to. <laughs> I just don't get it, man. I've talked, I don't know how many kids, they say, well, I smoke pot because I grew up with it. my parents smoke pot. I'm thinking, buddy, that's probably a great reason not to smoke it. Because they weren't there for you, they were nonchalant, and they didn't have much heart activity, and you felt slighted and lonely, and that's why you're smoking pot. Because now you're in the same la-la zone they were in. Come on, man, that's how straight I am with people. You don't smoke pot because your family smoked pot. Come on, that's a cop-out. You don't even say that. Don't say, well, I do this because they did this. And, come on, we've seen cancers run in people's family. We see certain diseases track great-grandmoms, moms, and daughters. And here's what happens to Christians. We go, oh, my goodness, that's a generational curse. And then we go, I'm next. And then we pray because of fear, because you're vulnerable, because you think you're next. Instead of saying, whoa, God, thank you for the covenant and the blood. I so appreciate that this thing stops here and has no more voice in my family. And no more will we suffer loss as a family because you've separated me and sanctified me into your kingdom. And I call no man on earth my father because I came forth from you and you're the one that delivers me. God, I'm not even praying about this again. I'm not fearful and there ain't no way this disease will ever be found in my flesh because we've drawn a line through the blood and I thank you for redemption through Jesus Christ. That's how you break a generational curse. I've seen people make generational curses more powerful by focusing on it. And they, they pray for people and they don't see change and they say, well, you're under a curse. And they leave the session 
told they're under generational curse and we'll be interceding and trying to come up with wisdom on how to get through this thing. Come on, guys, we're playing charades. We're, we're dabbling in things we don't even know what we're doing. This thing is not some grave mystery. Come on, don't tell somebody they're under a curse and then send them home. Don't say, well, it's a generational curse. We're going to fast for three days. Come on back. So for three days, you got them believing they're under a curse. I've had people come to me and say, I really need delivered. I got demons and I got evil spirits. I said, well, listen, I know you believe that, but right now I want to in, in, in encourage you into a line of prayer right now and I want you to get to pray some things with me and believe some things. And they start praying. And what's happening is they're oppressed by a spirit or a voice tells them this and this and this or a manifestation. We think everything we feel is who we are and everything we think is us. And this is crazy what's happened like this. And, and I just don't entertain devils, man. They're a cut off withering branch coming to nothing. And I don't entertain them. I won't put them on the stage. They'll perform. They have no identity. They love when you pay attention to them. I just don't mess with them things, man. And if they don't leave, if they, if, they, if they manifest and it's a real devil and it doesn't leave, there's a place we cast them out. It's rare it gets to that. I've hugged people in sincere love and devils leave people. I've seen deliverance without, without saying anything to a devil. Some people don't feel free. And because they don't feel free, they believe they're not. So they're waiting for the feeling to change. So the whole time they're feeling not free, they're believing they're in bondage. So they're seeking deliverance for a feeling to change. What would happen, because the just live by faith, that's a problem. You're setting yourself up for the devil to mess with you for the rest of your life. So even if somebody prays for you and you get a feeling of freedom in that area, what happens next week when you feel funny in another area? And then you say, wow, there must be another closet in my life. I must need more deliverance. So for the rest of your life, you're living by feelings and you're never okay because something keeps popping up. It's not healthy. He says he has delivered you. It's past tense. He has delivered you from the power of darkness, translated you in the kingdom of the son of his love. What would happen if a Christian by faith would close a bedroom door not feeling free and say, Lord God, the truth is you've delivered me and there's nothing holding me back now. Your love has rescued me. You snatched me out of darkness and you've obtained me. And I thank you that I am held in the power of your love and the strong hand of God. Thank you for delivering me. That right there just might be deliverance. <laughs> Is there a place for it? Yeah, I've preached and saw people manifest. I've had people freak out. I've prayed for them. Listen, guys, I've had people levitate when I prayed for them. I prayed for a lady, with, she was dabbling in witchcraft for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She passed out, she was praying in tongues. The Lord said, tell her to hush. It was an evil spirit praying. It was, it was masking. It was, and everybody's, yay, she's praying in tongues. The Lord said, tell her to stop. It's not because I had more discernment. It's because I'm in authority and I'm in position to hear. He just spoke to me. I wasn't more spiritual. See, that's what we say. Dan, has such a hearing here. No, I'm a pastor. I'm in position. God said, look, nobody has nothing unless it's given. Let's stop making so much of people. You wouldn't know a thing if God didn't tell you nothing. You wouldn't see a thing if God didn't show you a thing. There's no boasting in men. No man has nothing unless it's been given. He said, tell that thing to hush. I said, hush. That's what he told me to tell it, hush. I said, you hush. She shut up. But it wasn't her. I said, what's going on? He said, she's dabbling with witchcraft. She's crossing lines. She's got herself all mixed up. She's playing with tar tarot cards and she's messing with Ouija boards. She's inquisitive. She ignorantly dabbled into these things and there's things that have snared her life. I said, whoa. I said, hey, her eyes are closed. Hey, you've been messing around with Ouija boards, witchcraft, stuff like that. She didn't open her eyes, guys. I said, listen, I explained that, why that's not cool. And I said, listen, if you could go back and do that over, would you change that now that I told you what I told you? She said, I said, that's a really good answer. I said, now listen, you let her go. You have no access to her, no right to her. You let her go. She levitated. She lifted up six, eight, ten inches off the ground. Her whole body. And see, do you hear the wows? That's exactly why it did it. I'm not, con I'm not condemning you. What I'm saying is that's phenomenon to us. That's whoa. And we're impressed with that. We're actually freaked out by that. We're actually taken back by that. That is like, what? No, it's a stupid magic trick. It's a devil. Why does that impress you? Eternal life impresses me. Raised from the dead impresses me. 
Cancer d removed impresses me. Floating in the air? <laughs> Guys, I was, in a, I was in a house. The mom called me. She's freaking out because her baby's in the playpen. So she snatches her baby out of the playpen because when she's in the playpen, all the crib toys are hovering in the air over the baby. Oh, it's a stupid magic trick. It's the devil trying to put fear in the mama and rule the home and wreck her life and get her on a tangent and searching out all this stuff. And I said, honey, why are you impressed with that? I'm impressed with Jesus raising from the dead. Like when Jesus was dead, that stuff that's holding your toys up in there couldn't hold him down. Like he is Lord. It's a stupid magic trick. Stop giving it power by being impressed by it and tricked by it and freaked out by it. Amen. It's a cut off, withering branch coming to nothing. I was in a home where the ladies tell me all these manifestations while we're there, the flashlight goes from the counter to the table. She goes, see, 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 just tell it to leave. I said, honey, you need to stop. I said, let me just show you what just happened. I went up and I picked the flashlight up and I walked it to the counter. <laughs> You can see me, you couldn't see him. Why is that impressive? Do you know why the devil manifests and goes, Whoa! Because he likes when we go, Whoa! Why does he go, Boo? Whoa! Did you ever sneak up on anybody and freak them out? Did you ever hide because you knew they manifested when you scared them and you loved their face and couldn't get out of your head? <laughs> How much pleasure did you get out of coming from behind that door and going, oh, ah! and you laugh like a hyena for three minutes. You replay their face 20 minutes later and can't even breathe. I just think something like that's going on. The only reason he comes out of the grass and from hiding, because he's a snake in the grass. He usually sneaks around and stays undercover. The only reason he comes out and shows himself as he is is because we're impressed with him. And he goes, boo, because you go, ah. I promise you no fear takes care of that and having a greater covenant wipes that thing out. I'm concerned about a lot of mentalities in deliverance ministry because everything's a spirit and there's a lot of vulnerability and we're always under the control of something, and I just don't agree with that. I believe the thing you fear is what owns you. And if you fear the Lord, you're owned by Him. And if you're going through a struggle and something's trying to get in your life, there's a place to pray and believe in this and that, but always build yourself up in faith and identity. And I've prayed for people. I've seen the whole throw-up thing and the whole manifestation thing at times. I don't like it. I wish it wouldn't happen. There's stuff like that, but I don't, I don't usually find myself going after that stuff. I teach people who they are, and in finding out who they are, deliverance comes. You can pray for somebody to feel better, but if you don't give them truth, they might not feel better in a week. You can ask Jesus to come into their trauma and bring peace, but if you don't replace it with strong truth, they're a house that's clean and swept, and they're still unoccupied. And then that place, that thing comes from dry places and finds its home unoccupied. To say, I might as well bring some fellas with me, man. This place is a nice, clean house, lots of room. Not about just being clean and swept. It's about being occupied, being filled with truth. It's not just filled with the Spirit. He's the Spirit of truth. Yeah? Come on. Are you guys okay? So I'm not putting down ministries. I just see people get in identity crisis the longer they seek Deliverance, they say, I need deliverance. I say, I'm not so sure you do. Most people I've seen truly possessed by devils had no clue, and when it was over, they didn't even know what happened because they're under the control of it. Yeah? Some of the voices you hear that you know are devils are just playing cat and mouse with you. Ignore the voices and proclaim truth. If it's trying to heckle you, why don't you just tell Jesus who he is and who you are in him, and why don't you ignore the voice and have a good time with Jesus? If the voice is telling you you're unworthy, why don't you flip it and just be worthy? If it's telling you your life will never matter, why don't you thank God your life matters? If it's telling you you'll never be nothing, why don't you just worship Jesus and say, thank you for making me something? Why don't you flip that thing? Because it's coming to break you, but it runs the risk of making you if you're a believer. 
I hope you get that. All right. Can I just make a small comment? Sure, man. I, I love feel like I don't even. I can't even do Look this right him. now. Look at him. Is he born again or what? <laughs> Come on, man. This dude's born again. Is it true, Katie? You gotta <laughs> like Joey. Uh, yeah, just to comment on the feelings thing. Just because the devil knocks on your door doesn't mean he still lives in your house. So, oh. Sometimes we feel like, well, he's knocking on my door. I wonder if he still lives here. Well, if he lived there, he'd have authority. He'd just walk in, and he can't anymore. He has to knock. Dude, so dude, don't give him attention. I just wanted to comment on that real quick. Yeah, and you know what you do every time you talk? You stir me up and provoke Let's stories do it. in me. Listen, I got to tell you guys a story, okay? No, it's his fault. This is his fault. Blame this on Joey. Five years, I searched out the truth on this topic. I didn't want to be presumptuous. I just never felt comfortable with everything everybody wanted to do. I even had a deliverance man tell me, well, listen, everything you preach on the blood is awesome, but sometimes you just need more than the blood. Uh, that's, I'm the wrong guy to say that to. Listen. So I'm seeking five years. I'm interviewing people, ministers, people that got ministry. I found that in most cases, there was such a knowledge in these sessions of ministry that people actually found out things about themselves and sometimes they had no clue. I can just tell you that's not the Lord. The Lord doesn't bring things to your mind that you know nothing of and, and give you another hurdle on the track of your identity to jump. You're not two, and somebody did something to you, and you have no clue, and then the Holy Spirit says, well, when you were two, they did this to you. That's a lie from hell. The blood of Jesus is way greater than telling you things you don't know and expecting you to deal with the knowledge. He just takes it away. Well, the reason you feel this way, your mother said out loud she didn't want you when she found out she was pregnant, and that spirit of rejection is on you, and you need me to help you to get free. That's not true. You're accepted in the beloved. You have to believe the gospel, not the word and feeling and state of your mother when she was pregnant. You're making what the mother said greater than what Jesus accomplished. And you're saying, thank you for the gospel and the finished work, but excuse me, we've got to take care of some things so we can get here. Come on, guys. Holy Spirit is not... I interviewed people, they said, well, the session did me great because I found out why I am this way. <laughs> okay, now you got a permission slip. Well, what are you talking about? Well, when I was three... I pulled some green tomatoes off a vine that my dad planted and he beat me with a belt. Do you remember that? No, but they saw that when they prayed. Guys, that's demonic and bizarre. God doesn't bring that information to your memory, to your mind. He doesn't add that to your list. He just makes it like it never happened when you're a new creation. We're living like we're still alive. We're supposed to be dead to all that anyway. You're a new creation. You were buried in baptism into his death. Guys, if you don't have the memory, I understand if you have the memory of them knocking on your door, creeping in your room and abusing you when you were six, seven, and eight. There's a memory, there's emotions. I get that. There's a place where truth helps all that. I've seen the satanic ritual abuse stuff and everything set free in many cases in my life. And it was not the way I see a lot of people trying to get free. It was always through truth and Jesus' love. And here's the other thing. A lot of times we identify them through deliverance ministries for what they've been through. So people introduce themselves, well, I'm an SRA. No, you're not. That's tragic. No, you're not. Look, as long as you're saying I'm an SRA, there's no help for you. That's, you're an SRA. It's satanic ritual abuse, Vic. No. Yeah, I heard you questioning. <laughs> you're, you're not that. You're born again. And he snatched you out of darkness and he delivered you from that thing. And he's able to make you completely whole. So Joey's just said this about knocking on the door and about letting him in. Oh, I knew I liked you. <laughs> so I go to church. I have a healing service twice a week. I open to the public. It's healing service, right? 
So I've been seeking for five years. I'm five years into searching out this whole thing that he asked this question about because I don't want to be presumptuous and I haven't got a strong answer. I just have a conscience that tells me I don't agree with a lot of this stuff and I'm a gospel guy. I'm a Jesus, blood, it's enough, yay. Right? I just believe it's impossible to reject me because I'm not living to be accepted. I already am. Like I didn't wake up for you to love me. I woke up to be like him. That's pretty freeing. So there's nothing you can do to stop that and hold me back. You can cheer me on. You can't possibly slow it down. Yay. <laughs> so I went to church and did the morning healing service. A 63-year-old lady couldn't see. We prayed for her and her eyes opened and it's fun. It's amazingly fun. And she began to read everything on the walls and people cried and she cried because she couldn't see. That was the morning. Other things happened. The evening, a 12-year-old boy came. We preached. It was an advertised healing service. We preached. They brought him up blind from birth in his left eye. We closed his right eye and prayed. And he said, I see shadows. I see silhouettes. I said, really? Is that normal? Did you used to see? I've never, it's always been black, sir. Let's pray again. I said, what do you see? It was phenomenal. He goes, I see her, and her, and him. And you just cry. You just cry. And you worship Jesus. Two blind eyes in one day. Feels good, makes you happy. Other things, everybody leaves the church. I stay there, leave the lights off. I kneel at the altar, I'm crying. I'm just laying before the Lord and I'm thanking him for the momentum and what he's doing in our city. I'm thanking him for the lady, the boy, the faithfulness of God, the gospel. Let us keep growing, yay. And I'm just having a great time. I hung back, I just hung out. I hung with Jesus, nobody in the church but me and him. So I'm leaving. I know the church like my own house. And I got the exit lights on and in the corners. Just they're always on. But there's no lights. I'm walking through the church in the dark. I get down to the back door. I'm the whole way down the steps to the back door. And it wasn't one of those recollections where you go, oh, my keys. I was heading out. And the Holy Spirit said, hey. And I listened. He said, you go out that door and let it close. You'll be locked out. Your keys are upstairs. And I'm like, man, I wouldn't have no keys for this kingdom. I wouldn't even be able to drive my car. <laughs> Pastor would be walking a mile home. Where's your car? Uh, back there. <laughs> I said, you're awesome. Thanks for loving me. I said something like, what would I do without you? Be locked out. <laughs> it wasn't me. It was him. So I ran upstairs to the church, and, and I'm hustling up. Thank you, Lord. And I'm just having fun. It was a great day, guys. I was 42 years old. Great day, man. 42 years old. Kingdom of God is in me. I'm born again. Two blind eyes open. Oh, it's a good day. That's what you're thinking. So I run up to get my keys and I open the door and the door to the sanctuary goes. Burr. When I was nine, my sister was born. She took priority in our home and kicked me and my brother out of our bedroom. Sent us to the attic third floor wood floors no carpet creaky door deliverance mentality says see brother because I flashbacked and remembered that feeling that came on me when I had to go to my bedroom every night how I'd run by that one closet and dive in my bed and hit the light after I knew I was okay freaked me out going to bed I used to watch Tales of the Crypt. They'd have that camera running through the house, down the steps, around the corner. I knew it was coming. I'm sitting there. I watched it a hundred times, and I'm like, and all of a sudden the coffin door. And then you sit there and watch the crazy, horror, ridiculous thing, and then you go up to your bed, and you're 11. I did it to 
for myself all the time. So now I'm 42, blind eyes are opening, and Jesus is amazing, and I'm born again. A deliverance minister says, see, there's fear in your life, Dan. There's still a little boy trapped in you we need to minister to. You think because I had a feeling of fear, and somebody knocked on the door. I walked down, I left the lights off. Jesus is in me. I'm not buying this thing. I'm not calling my buddy Brandon and saying, Brandon, I really need prayer, man. I don't know what's going on. I've been experiencing fear. As soon as you do that, you let it in. You sell cheap and you're not for sale. And you let a feeling become you. Let me tell you what happened. I walked up and I picked up my keys. They were laying right there like Holy Spirit said. I had this feeling on me the whole time walking down the aisle like I used to feel walking down the hall when I was 12, 11, 9. It's just a familiar spirit. It's a thing that owned me looking for an opportune time to get me deceived and sell cheap when I'm not for sale. Right in the heat of the kingdom manifesting and me, guys, I'm born again, I'm 42, a door creaks, and all of a sudden I'm in bondage? Because I remember my childhood? Cut me a break. I wish people would teach this so we'd stop living central and letting every feeling decide us. I'm singing a song about the blood. I'm heading up front. All those feelings were there. They were real, and I'm not denying them. They, it felt like the same thing I encountered trying to get to my bedroom when I was a kid. Deliverance mentality says, see, brother, you've never been set free. You've been saved. You just haven't been delivered. That thing's been lingering all these years. You are so wrong. I picked up the keys, and I turned, and the Lord opened my eyes because I've been seeking him for five years. Not fighting people, not arguing. That's why I talk with confidence. Because I know I sought the Lord for a long time. I turned and I saw two dark silhouettes for a second and a half hovering right at head level. And they went like this. That's all I can tell you. They were silhouettes of dark figures like this. And as soon as I saw them, I went, wow. I knew what it was. I just knew because he showed them to me. And they disappeared. And as soon as they disappeared, guess what the Lord said? It's what you said. He said, see, Dan? They're outside trying to get in. They owned you once, and they're trying to get you to believe they still do, and you're still the same. Don't you ever let them in. And I went, oh! And I got my answer. And I walked through the church just a singing and singing about the blood, and I still had this sense that they were there and they weren't giving up. And I'm walking through the dark halls and I still had a little tinge of that feeling of when I was a kid. It was really something how that was real. That's where you sell cheap when you're not for sale. And you think because you experienced it, it's in you. No, it's trying to get there. So I remember, see, when I'm by myself and I'm besides myself, it's for God. You weren't there. I wasn't trying to communicate. So I went to the door and right when I got to the door, the punchline to the song I was singing came to a and it, was, and it was all about Jesus being Lord. This little song that came out of my heart, I was singing, it was spontaneous. And right when I got to the door, I'll never forget it. The, the, the last line of the song Holy Spirit was giving me was, because Jesus is Lord. Jesus is, and I spun around and I went, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is, and I'm singing like a maniac. <laughs> going through a dark hallway. You weren't there. You couldn't call me kooky. Jesus is Lord. And I went, yeah, and I started to pray and worship God and declare things. I freaked out. I was bouncing off the walls, man. Why? Because these devils came and tried to make me believe something I wasn't. Jesus showed me who I really am. And then I had more passion than ever. And I was more convinced than before. My confidence level went. Yeah? And he left and looked for an opportune time. And when he came, he was trying to break me and stop the momentum and bring down the house. But he ran a risk of making me. And I think he made a mistake. Yeah? 
four or five years before that, witchcraft came and tried to kill me three times. And in my mind, I thought I was going to die. And I had more pain than I could ever describe, and I didn't know a man could endure. And we say, well, if you, and if you got righteous, and you understand, how can he do that? You say, why is he touching you? You need to look in my eyes to see if he's touching me. Yeah. I had a pastor say, but look at your leg. I said, when do you preach that from the pulpit? Another pastor said, well, then how can he touch you? I said, maybe you're looking at the wrong place. Lift your eyes and look here. And tell me if he's touching you. Oh, you guys, man. See, I'm a maniac. I just play it cool. I don't preach the way I am usually, see, because it would freak people out probably. It was devils trying to kill me. The Lord said it was voodoo. And I said, what do I do? And he laughed and said, what do you do? He said, believe me. I said, okay. I had the most dramatic experience. They tried to kill me. And they didn't and they couldn't. Jesus rose me up out of that place where I was passing out. A waterfall opened in my ceiling and poured over me and I can't even describe the things that happened to me. I don't even talk about it because people chase that stuff. I didn't even think about that stuff. I just love Jesus. But that stuff happened. <laughs> Those things have never touched me since. Guys, I feel so amazing in my body. I don't even try to talk about it because people get condemned because some people are really hurting and I'm not judging and comparing. I'm just telling you, I don't know how to be afraid when those things were trying to kill me. It wasn't about my life. It was about his name. I can tell you there was no fear and it wasn't about dying. It was about honoring him and standing strong. I drug myself around like a slug on the floor. Couldn't even walk. My daughter bawled and cried one night when I was going to bed. And I said, honey, don't you be moved by this. Stop crying for me. She said, I'm not. I'm crying because of you. I said, what do you mean? She said, I know if I was in your shoes, I'd be a mess. And you never change, Dad. You make me cry. <laughs> There's something in me called the kingdom of God. Yeah? And you're just not afraid. And see, that kind of experience, you don't dread it, you don't fret it, and when it's over, you don't wish it didn't happen. It's hard to explain. You wouldn't trade it in for nothing because it helped fashion what you are today. And you wouldn't be what you are if it wasn't for those things. And because you keep your eyes on him, everything that's trying to break you helps make you, and it's all part of the equation, and we win. But you don't grow weary in well-doing, and you don't give in to fear, and you don't serve a lie. And you love not your own life unto death. So after I got free that night and it never came back, I cried in my bed. This isn't arrogance and it's not judgment to you. I cried in my bed for at least an hour and said, God, are we your people even ready for what warfare really is and for this kind of stuff? Or do we love ourselves too much and are we Christians for our sake? Do we even have a chance in what we believe about you enduring these kind of assaults in a revelation or will we get overcome with quandary? That's how I cried for an hour asking those questions and asking God to help us and have mercy. Because I pastor and I know there's a lot of mentalities that collapse in that kind of seriousness. When my marriage wasn't a marriage and my wife was in deep duress and deception, People would call me and were only going through a little tiny fraction of what I was facing and they would be broken and ready to give up on their spouse. And they would say, well, you don't understand what I'm going through. And I couldn't exploit my wife. But it was amazing to me how we compare ourselves among ourselves and they said, you don't understand what I'm going through. And they weren't even touching the tip of what I was right in the middle of falling apart because their spouse was quiet for three weeks. Ready to move on. Thank God he didn't move on on you. I don't know. I got to sit down. That's a long answer, isn't it? 
Don't you get a flashback. Don't you get an experience, a fear, a flashback, a memory, and buy in and say it's you because you felt it. Don't you have a dream in the middle of the night and say, wow, I thought I was over that. You have the dream, you wake up and you say, God, I thank you. I am so free from all those things. And I thank you. Don't you drive in your car to work, young lady, and picture that sexual stumble you had and feel defiled for a second and then call somebody for prayer and deliverance because you're remembering the moment. Your heart's broken by the vision. It means it's not you. You're not concocting the memory. It's coming to break you, let it make you. And while you're driving to work and that picture comes and that graphic picture of you in the middle of what you wish you could forget, you look up and say, God, and still keep your eye on the road. <laughs> and you say, God, I thank you for the change in my life. You've made me a brand new woman. I thank you you've purified me and cleansed me and you've delivered me from nonsense and weakness and vulnerability and false desire and you've put a stronghold in me and you're my rock and my defense and I love you and I worship you. And that little devil that's going yeah, yeah, yeah and popping those visions, he goes, well, I didn't show you that. I didn't say nothing about God. You go ahead and freak him out. Ignore him. A little flashback comes, a little memory comes. You picture that person touching you sexually and abusing you when you were eight. Don't you curl up in a fetal position and cry now that you're a Christian. You rise up and you push through the temptations of those feelings. And you say, Father, I thank you I'm not an eight-year-old boy. And I thank you, God, that you snatched me out of darkness. And uncle had no idea what he was doing, and if he knew you, he'd have never done that to me. It's no reflection on me or my value. It's a reflection on the the vacuum in his life. And God, I thank you. I will not let his sin decide who I am. I will let your resurrection prove that and your spirit in me decide me. And I am done believing lies. I am a man of truth and a product of truth and you live in me and there ain't no stopping us now. <laughs> That's deliverance. The truth shall make you free. It's not... Free, free, freedom, free. I've prayed for people and sincerely said the word free and saw God do dramatic things. But you, the little bit, you know my heart. You know that after the fact, I poured mega truth into them and gave them a rock to stand on. Yeah? I'm sitting down. Did that answer the question? I think it did. <laughs> oh, and no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hey, you guys can Joking. go home. You guys can go home. Thanks for coming out tonight. We bless you guys. That's how I feel, man. <laughs> um, I feel like so fulfilled. Real quick, before we move on, um, and I don't want you to answer any of this stuff because you hit on it a lot during the afternoon session today, just about sin and Romans and stuff. And so we're not really going to address all the sin questions. I just don't feel like we need to, okay? And there's a video, and we're going to throw it up on YouTube, and Dan taught all about it today. But just one thing to chew on real quick, because I, I know this thing dominates the minds of people. Sin, sin, sin. That, what about this? What about that? To just think about this. Take it home. If the only time you're free from sin is when you die, then Jesus won't be your savior. Death will. Okay? So think about that for a second. You call him savior and Lord and, and all these things, but you're waiting to die so you can be free? Then death is. Death is king. Death reigns. And, and uh, uh, inevitably, death will be your savior. So just think about that because I feel like we get so fascinated with sin. Be fascinated with Jesus. Like, it's not that hard, okay? Come on, buddy. I love this guy. Oh, my goodness. Oh. I just wanted to get that on camera. Right there. That right there. Okay, we're moving, we're moving on. We're moving on. Back in the kingdom. Um, Brandon, you had a question. Well, I, I, I kind of feel like, Pastor Dan, you kind of just answered it. But I wanted to... Uh, it was a, mm. okay, so I remember talking to you about this before, and I'm glad you explained the whole deliverance and truth thing, um, but what you just expounded on reminds me of a situation that I had before, and um, where we were, you know, in some services, and we was, you know, some people were getting free from some spirits and stuff like that, and I had something plaguing me for like two or three weeks. And I remember talking to you about it. My wife was interceding with me about it. 
And uh, every night at the exact same time, this massive migraine would hit me. And uh, I remember the last night it was happening, um, it, ha it hit me so heavy. I told my wife, I called her out of the room, and I said, babe, we have to go to the hospital. Like, I can't take it. And I was sitting on the couch, and I was reading my word, and my mouth went numb, and I felt my hand shaking, and this headache was just hitting me so bad. She walks in the kitchen, and uh, I just get this, something just came over me. I knew it was the presence of God. And I spoke to it. I said, listen, I'm not afraid of you, and this, this is going to break off my life. And I asked my wife, I said, give me a piece of bread and give me some water. And I broke communion, and for six hours, praise the Lord, but from, for six hours, from that time to 6 a.m., it was horrible. I threw up like four times and all this stuff, and all I could say out of my mouth was mercy, oh, mercy, thanks. mercy, thanks. mercy. But I remember at 6 o'clock on the dot, I felt it lift off of me and leave me, and it never came back. But before that, we had talked on the phone, and you, you, you relive, relive one of these stories, and you was talking to me about faith. Just believing, just believing, just believing. And there was two passages of scripture the Lord took me back to. He took me back to 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans 14 that teaches me that faith is like a magnet. It's going to bring to me whatever I believe. And if I open up the door to believe that these things have a voice in my life, that I haven't, you know, been delivered from these things, that it will, it will give it an opportunity to manifest even though I'm not possessed. You know, and so what I was going to ask you to talk about, but I think you just did a, such a fantastic job of it. What I was going to ask you to talk about is the power of faith, the difference between deliverance and then freedom and how truth is the only thing that really brings us into thing. a place of ever being free. You know, so I was just going to ask you just to kind of expand, but I think you kind of did. Yeah. Yeah. And the, In the last half hour, I answered everything. Everything. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, yeah, <laughs> no, but you did. No, so. But it's good. It's it, Brandon. What Brandon's talking about is the reality is he still had a six hour experience in the face of what he believed was faith. And it was. And I've learned that sometimes we don't even find real, true faith. Sometimes we pray because we have need. Sometimes it's the problem that's motivating us. It's not faith. Be real with me. Sometimes you don't even find faith till you have every reason not to believe. Till rationally every circumstance suggests something else and that's where you can really find faith because you lock in to wait a minute. This is what he said. This is who I am. This is what's true. So I'm not yielding to you. I'm not afraid. I'm not, God, it's not about, when I thought I was dying, I smiled out of my heart and I said, Jesus, I don't even believe I'm dying, but it feels like I am. But even if I would die on some day that I would die or something like that, I'm not even believing I'm dying. God. I'm just believing you're going to walk me through this. But I'm just letting you know this. And I was saying this for my own soul and for any lie that was wrapping around and hanging around me. And I said, I said, I will worship you. You are always Lord, and I'm not afraid. I love you, Jesus. And I was in so much pain, I could hardly function. He's going through the same thing. This thing is trying to get in him, change his tune, change his direction, change his mind, get him in a quandary, get him to have more questions than he has answers and step out of everything God's been building in him. It's a storm trying to bring down the house, but because it's on his personal being and he feels the pain, if you internalize it and take it personal, you're going to make a great mistake. If you're not thinking for the kingdom. So faith is very important in this thing. You can't let your experience change what you believe. You see what I'm saying? So people say, yeah, but Dan, when I was in that situation, but look at your leg. I say, guys, stop. I'm never supposed to let my leg define God. God's in the position to define my leg. Why do we get it backwards? Because you have sentiment towards me and you care about me and you're afraid for me? And now you're telling me to do something you'd never preach from the pulpit? Behind closed doors? Stop, guys. Here's what the Lord showed me a long time ago. He said, my people are, he said, I created man to subdue, not be subdued. My people are, my people are vulnerable in the world in which they live. And they let natural knowledge decide them. There's a difference between eating healthy and eating preventative. Eating healthy is just taking care of your temple. Eating preventative is vulnerability. You're trying to do something to avoid something the gospel's already sanctified you from. 
You're putting yourself in the same category as every man that's ever had the experience in whatever you're preventing. Here's what the Lord asked me, because I didn't know what was happening that morning. I didn't ask for this. I woke up to this. My people are vulnerable to the world in which I live, and vulnerability is fear. That's what he said. And here's what he said. So profound, it wrecks me. It's faith. Why do men die of secondhand smoke? It's what he asked me. I guess scientifically you could answer that. I guess you could do the study because there's a lot of talk about it. They say secondhand smoke is more lethal than firsthand smoke. That the secondhand smoke inhaler has worse complications than the one that's given off the, the smoke. For whatever reason, because of the scientific and the... And the Lord said, why do people die of secondhand smoke? And I'm laying on my bed. I don't even really, I'm like, only you know, Lord. <laughs> Guess what he said? So profound. He said, because they believe they can. Can I tell you what, what went on right after that? He said, Dan, what do you think the strategy is of the major sicknesses on the earth? Wow. He said, what do you think cancer's goal is? To get so much momentum, cause so much loss, so much grief, and so much pain that when men hear its name, they fear, and cancer becomes the name above every name. Wow. And then men in fear, and all through the loss and pain and sorrow, attempt to proclaim my name, hoping something works. Wow. <laughs> hey, I didn't ask for the conversation. <laughs> but you be real with me. Very few people in this room haven't been touched by cancer somehow, some way. And it's very painful and it's not fun to watch and it breaks your heart when they die and when their body changes and when they don't even look like your relative. I've been so involved with praying for people and sick and sick and I've held children. You have no idea what I've been in the middle of. I've been frontline active my whole Christian life. I've held kids where tumors were busting through their head, their eyes went blind. We're praying, we're believing, we're going after God. We've won some and we've lost some. And when you lose them, they really, really, really hurt. Because they're kids a lot of times. And you're like, Duh, and your mind wants to go bonkers. You better take a deep breath and regroup and not make this about your feelings, emotion, and rational thinking. You better go back to square one and say, if Jesus touched them, they'd be healed. I need to keep growing and you keep doing a work in me, but I ain't backing down because I believe what your words say. <laughs> you encourage the parents and the families in the same truth. And don't tell me I haven't suffered loss. I've suffered loss, people. And I talk, I watch my own mother die of sickness. Don't tell me I don't understand. I changed my mother's diapers and carried her to bed. Don't tell me I don't understand. You're wrong. Her death doesn't change the gospel. I don't find God through my mother. I find God through his son. And unless you love less your mother, you'll by no means enter in and be his disciple. Yeah? Sometimes you're so close to that thing, it's hard. It's the biggest challenge of my Christian life, watching my mother suffer and seeing other people heal. And religion says, well, God heals some and doesn't heal all. You can't find that in Jesus' life. Stop trying to preach that to me. It says, it says, if you believe, you'll say the mountain and nothing will be impossible for you. It doesn't say unless, of God, unless of course, God's will to otherwise. You can't find it in Jesus' life. Don't find it in your belief system. Don't explain away your troubled soul at the cost of truth where freedom comes from. Five months after my mother died, I was in a service and watched a lady healed of the same disease that killed her who hadn't moved or walked 
for five and a half years. And her body came alive because I won't change the gospel and get bruised. And I won't say, well, you didn't heal my mother. I'm done praying for everybody else's mother. God never gave me a mother at the cost of who he is. He gave me the blessing of a mother in light of who he is. So we rightly steward his image and his presence. Don't you take life personal, you'll make a big mistake. You take the gospel personal, you'll do well. Amen? Amen. Watch this. When you look at me, you can't tell my mother died of sickness. You can't tell my dad was an alcoholic and never said I love you. You can't tell I was touched inappropriately. You can't tell my kids took off and made grave mistakes and cost themselves years and my son ran off into drugs and my wife was in crisis for a long time. When you see me, you don't see any of that, do you? Come on. You're not supposed to. <laughs> the Christian testimony is no smell of smoke. <laughs> Come on. Can you tell those things? Can you tell I've been treated unjustly? You, can you tell that there was some false accusations years ago about some things? Can you tell that... Can you? You're not supposed to, church. You're supposed to bear witness of what He went through, Come on. not what you've been through. That's Christianity. And that's faith. Yeah. Woo. yeah, I feel so happy. <laughs> See, I try, I'm a madman, but I try to play it cool. But I'm a madman. The gospel's changed my mind. You say, you're out of it. No, I'm probably out of yours. <laughs> no, just kidding. That's good. <laughs> it's just all good. Um, Okay, here's a good question. Do you think the church, in some extent, is defining a lot of who they are in their life and the gospel through the failures of Paul and his teachings versus the success and life of Jesus? Through the? Through the failures of Paul. Oh, we tend to compare ourselves to men. We say, well, we, we, people that contest doctrines on healing, and it's God's will to heal, they say, well, Paul told that guy to drink wine. Why didn't he just heal him if it's well got to heal? And we're following men instead of following Jesus. We forget that Paul cried out, oh, that I might know him. Well, it looks like you did, Paul. You knew him more than anybody that ever lived. You got revelation straight from him. But yet he's crying out, Paul, oh, that I might know you in the power of your resurrection. Why? There's things he had a revelation of in the sense of what he was writing about that he wasn't always experiencing in his own life. He's crying out for more. He said, I haven't arrived. I haven't apprehended. Don't make me the goal. That's what he's really saying to us. He's crying out. Only follow me as I follow him. If, if Paul was our example, why is he crying out that he might know him when it looks like he does? Because he's not seeing the full extent of what he purchased through his life. And he wants us to follow Jesus, not him. Are you guys with me? So it's real simple. That stop following human experience and even people we respect. And let's follow Jesus. My kids came to me when they were in their mid-teens. They said, Dad, we need to talk. They were just ready to go run wild. I said, okay, what's up? Well, we've been thinking and talking. Okay. We've just realized, Dad, you're out of balance and there ain't nobody like you. In their world, in their sphere of influence. And they started naming leaders in our church and even our pastor. And started to name and mention the weakness they've discerned and the fault they found. And they said, Dad, you're just too much Jesus. I didn't preach to my kids, I just lived to Jesus. When you're not pursuing God and somebody's surrendered, it makes you uncomfortable. It makes you resentful. It got so bad that I couldn't even read my Bible in the living room because my family would say, look at him, reading his Bible, sending a message, did we read our Bibles today? When I don't even think that way or preach that way. That was their own violated conscience. Accusing me of doing something I'm not even thinking. Isn't that something? 
So they said, well, we've just realized you're too extreme. You're too much Jesus. Dad, there's nobody out there like you. And I'm like, I don't know if that's the point. You just mentioned so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. Kids, that's so unfair. We're not following them. We're following Jesus. So maybe you guys need to crack open your Bibles, take a good look at his life, come back and tell me if Dad looks like anybody you know. I said, because here's what I realize is happening. You guys are ready to take off and run wild in your flesh. You're looking for an out. You're looking, I'm your last hurdle. And if you can jump me, you're going to take off and do whatever you're planning. And for your conscience sake, you're trying to get past me and you're trying to justify what you're pursuing. Guys, it'll never change truth. We're following Jesus. Both my kids left that meeting and went and did what they wanted to do. Not because I was a hypocrite, because they had desire. It's amazing how parents think because their kids run wild, they fail. And how we draw our identity from our children. And we believe our children are a direct reflection of us. That wouldn't be fair to say of God. Is dad, is God the greatest father ever? Is he the greatest daddy ever? Come on. Are you guys sure about that? <laughs> so God's the best father there ever will be. Does he need a parenting program? Is everybody running to his lap to sit? Is it a reflection of the father or the kid? So good. Let's stop saying everything falls on the parent. We get up in intercession, it's all about the fathers. When the fathers, and if the fathers, and we quote Malachi, and the fathers. Man, we put a lot of pressure on some good dads. And we made them think if their kids are failing, somehow they fail. Look, if you want to see me, look to me. If you want to see my kids, look to them. If you want, I heard a preacher stand up some one day and said, if you want to find a real man of God, you need to look to the countenance of his wife. <laughs> I'm like, wonder if his wife's an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not fair, the stuff we preach. I don't even know how people get qualified to get a mic <laughs> when they say stuff like that. It's damaging and it's not true. We can be more secure than that. We go to pray. We pray because our kids have destiny, not because we fail. And if you think you failed or you're convicted of failure, why don't you fall in the mercy of God and let his redemptive power kick in and where the weak are, let them be made strong. And say, God, you know, when he was four, five, and six, I yelled at him a lot and I told him some things I wish I'd have never said. Please don't let that be a repercussion in his life. Please swallow up those words with your mercy and let my son run well and be everything I know he really is. In this day and hour, I realize those words were a venting and a frustration. I'm in a greater covenant. You've forgiven me of those things. So then don't let the repercussion of those things fall upon his life. Let your mercy triumph and, and rise over judgment. God, thanks for the redemption of my son. And then you get over what you did 15 years ago and you stop blaming yourself and you don't lose your productivity and you keep on shining and you believe. Yeah? Okay. That's really good. All right, let's do an audience one real quick. Christoph, Christoph has something. More questions? Are you out there? I thought we answered every question. Yeah, I had a question. So me and Joey are really good friends and I commented on someone's Facebook help. video uh, we were just talking about like, so I was just encouraging the person about their video and just like, hey, like, that's so good. Like, there's this scripture and that scripture. Like, that's amazing. Like, Jesus, like, he set us free, all this stuff. I'm right here. No, you can't good. see I'm me. Okay. I'ay. I'm just trying to follow you. There's okay. something about where I'm sitting. Hold it closer. Well. Better? No, no, you're yeah. good. Is this okay. about, is this I'm, about I'm your getting... testimony video? No, something else. Yeah, about the video where that guy started arguing with us and we were just like trying to, like, hey, man, we're, like, we don't see differently. You're just reading us wrong. 
So um, the guy has been really posting about, okay, well, like modern Christianity, like they're not obeying the law, like the law of God, the Mosaic law and the Levitical laws. And I understand like we're free to marry another, just like Roman says, like we've married Christ, we've died to the law and married Christ. But Jesus said, like, if you love me, you obey my commandments. Right. So, so how do we go about keeping the Sabbath and about all these unclean foods and haircuts and tattoos and all that <laughs> stuff? I've just been really confused. Yeah, like, yeah just, it's not... It's, he's, he's, yeah, those kind of commandments are, are there, there's 600, what, 632 laws? I mean, you know, the Ten Commandments is the principles of God, the nature of God, the person of God. Here's the deal. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's not a challenge. He's not saying, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll do what I say to do. Because you love me. So what's first? You see his first love, and you love him. And if you love him, you realize his way is right and wise, and it trumps and overrides every illicit thing, every desire, and you begin to grow in the truth. And if you love him, you obey his commandment. It's not legalism. It's not, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. He's not saying, go prove you love me. Love <laughs> fulfills the law because it does no harm to a neighbor. Jesus himself said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for men. Men weren't made for the Sabbath. I made the Sabbath so you would do what I did, and on the seventh day, I rested from my works. Enter into my rest. He made the Sabbath so men would get a grip, focus, and look to... He said, but the Sabbath was made for men. Men weren't made for the Sabbath. That's profound. <laughs> so Paul said, listen, some of you see every day the same. He's talking about faith. Some of you esteem one day different than the rest. Stop fighting over it, because if you do it unto the Lord, God will make you both stand. And whatever's not of faith is sin. Some of you eat only vegetables. Some of you eat meat. Stop arguing over it. If you do what you do unto the Lord, God will make you stand. If your eating causes your brother to stumble, you're no longer walking in the law of love. So if I have a belief that Joey doesn't have and he esteems one day separate than the rest and I esteem every day the same and I say, Joey, dude, man, your answer's rock. You're so amazing. You impress me. Why are you hung up on this Sabbath thing? Dude, get free. You're not under the law. Come on, man. Bam, bam, bam. What the Bible says is I'm missing Joey's heart. I'm being presumptuous and I'm trying to push my belief on him and I'm no longer walking in love. I don't have to feel compelled. If what he's doing is sincere and before the Lord, he says the Lord will make Joey stand. Some people that don't esteem one day different and just esteem every day the same might not even do it under the Lord. They just might live nonchalant. Then they're actually doing injustice to this thing. But if you esteem every day the same and do it under the Lord, it's the same as Joey honoring one day different than the rest because it's both under the Lord. We need to stop fighting over it. It's right in Scripture. There was people that wouldn't eat meat because the meat was being sacrificed to Belial and gods and things. So then they'd take that meat and take it over to the market. So they'd, they'd sacrifice these things to, to demonic gods. And then they'd take the meat. They'd cut its throat and the blood on the altar. And then they'd skin that thing out and go take it over to the market. And people would buy the steak. The Christians didn't want to buy the steaks because they didn't want to eat meat that was defiled and sacrificed to God. And Paul said, if you have faith, all things are okay to receive if you receive it with thanksgiving. And he said, 
if you have faith, go ahead and eat it. He said, people that are weak in faith are only eating vegetables. What's he saying? He's not saying a vegetarian doesn't have faith. He said, people that can't see past the sacrificing to idols and only eat vegetables are weak in the faith that they're exercising in the situation, but please leave them alone. Their conscience is clear and they're doing it unto the Lord. Stop trying to change them if it'll stumble them. Stop lording over them, getting self-righteous and telling them they're not free. And brother, you need to get free. We're in a better covenant. Come here, man, look. <laughs> he says, you're stumbling, your brother, and you're no longer walking in the law of love. It's Romans 14. Read it. It's profound. Yeah? Yeah. That's... I just hope I'm answering you. You got to listen. The law... He said, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength. And the second is, like it, love your neighbor as yourself. We talked about this this weekend. He said, on these two, you can hang all the law and all the prophets. Which tells me if I love the Lord with all my heart, I'll keep his commandments. And if I love my neighbor as myself, I'll walk in the fulfillment of the law without trying to fulfill the law. And that's called living by grace, not law. Man, that's good. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, can I just say one thing to that real quick? Oh. I know Dan's here, but you're stirring me up. And Please, I just... man. Hey, dude, you said two things and wrecked me. <laughs> well, Look third, where I'm third sitting. Third time's a charm. So. <laughs> Look where I'm sitting. I was over there. Uh, yeah, if you study it, so in Deuteronomy 4, that's when the law, it, actually, I think the title is like, God's law introduced. The first, first verse in Deuteronomy 4 says, this is the law given to the Israelites. So if you study that time period, the law was never given to Gentiles. Actually, it was never even intended for Gentiles. It was intended for the Israelites during that period, during that time, during that geographical location. And if you study it even more, and Eric, I know Eric's looking at me because we've taught this before, the law can only be fulfilled by a specific people, Jews, what was Jesus? right? During a certain period of time, a certain way. So us being Gentiles now brought in, grafted in, the law was never even intended for you. It was never even intended for you. And we keep looking back, not realizing that there's been a Jew who's fulfilled the law for us and now we're found in him. Simple. Just move on. Don't even deal with that thing. <laughs> we're done. That's crushed. Dude. <laughs> Sorry. I hate when people are confused. I hate it. I can't stand it. So, and I Did just love you. Did you notice Esau. my answers were better when I sat this close? <laughs> Don't even start. Okay, I got a really good question. Well, I got to so find it because there's so many questions here. Oh my goodness! Okay. Are they all questions? <laughs> These are all questions. Ah, I've never had. We're so going many. home. Yeah, we're we're and you know what, guys? We're 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 almost wrapping up. We're not there yet, but we're almost there. Okay. The, the question's real, here real quick. Let me look it up oh really quick. Goodness, are they all questions? They're, these are all questions, Dan. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? Okay. This is, how do you hang out with, and this is, this is a three-part question. How do you hang out with unsafe family members and, and switch an environment when you're talking and maybe they're gossiping or whatnot and you switch it to like kingdom talk and, and how do you keep pouring into them if they're just shutting down and there's walls and they don't really hear you. Man, that's amazing. What a good question, because that happens to a lot of us. That's happened to me when I got saved. We'd always gather for Thanksgiving when I first got saved. Grandparents were still living. They'd had the big gatherings. So when I first got saved, people were like, hey, how are you guys doing? How are you doing, Dan? That's the wrong question to ask me. <laughs> if, if you're being rhetorical, because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> and Jesus is coming out of my mouth. So the kids are like, and the adults are like, oh my God. And it got to a point where I'd go for Christmas or Thanksgiving, they wouldn't even talk to me or ask me how I'm doing. And here's what I learned. You just let your life speak. You're not compelled. You don't have to always preach to your family. Don't get into a stronghold over this thing and don't feel like you have to always be the salvation of your family. Be a seed in their life. Be a living epistle. Be an example. Let your life win respect. Don't be in a rush. God is not limited to you as the tool to save your family. Oh, that's good. Wow. Just live upright and sincere and don't press. We don't realize how much we've preached at our families. 
because we feel compelled to get them to shake their head when we do, to say what we say and believe what we believe. That's never been my goal. Even when I talk to somebody in society, you might not agree with this, my goal is never to get them saved when I initially meet them and get them to pray a prayer that we call the sinner's prayer. My goal is to love them sincerely and give them one of the most vital encounters they've ever had with God. Because Holy Spirit will take them to the place we all desire. Some so, guys. Some water. It's God who gives the increase. There's people that reap where they haven't even sowed. And then we call them a great evangelist. No, they're reaping because somebody sowed. And we all rejoice together. You sow, you go to bed tonight, you wake up and go, whoa, God, how do you do that? It's, it's in Mark 4. So let's, let's understand that you don't have to, if they're starting to gossip and all that stuff, of course you don't enter in and gossip and laugh. And, but don't get weird either. <laughs> don't be like, oh my God, we're just going to leave. You know, people read a Smith Wigglesworth. He's pretty forthright. People got to know who he was. But don't read that and then try to do what he did if you weren't living where he's living and, and have the motive he's having. There's things. I see Todd. My buddy Todd, he gets away with everything. And he's awesome because he doesn't have pretense. He's ignorant to a lot of things. And he doesn't have any second thoughts. Todd breaks every rule man has ever written. He... <laughs> He goes up to people's tables while they're eating and having... He just walks right up with his dreads and all, and they're eating a meal. And he says, hey, guys. And their food just came, and they're paying for it, and it's hot. And, they're... and for 20 minutes, they'll stand there and pour on his heart, and they're bowling, and he's praying, and nobody forgets that nobody even remembers they ordered food. You try that, and they freak out, and can't you see we're eating? And... Because you might do it because it's the Christian thing you're supposed to do. There's a difference. You don't do it trying to make yourself feel like you're what you say you are. You don't do it because of obligation. You don't do it because you're supposed to. You do it because of love. You don't do it because you're like, oh man, look at that. I should go over there. And you're like, ah. Oh. I don't know, they're eating. Ooh, maybe, well, yeah, but I better do it because Todd doesn't go through any of that. He's just sitting talking. He goes, oh. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I was in the Chili's with him, and we're all sitting. It's a whole table of pastors. And this lady comes walking in with a bunch of ladies around her. Walker. And I went, oh. And I looked at Todd, because you don't want to overwhelm her. We don't know both need to. I looked at Todd, and he went. <laughs> Pastors are talking. He lets her go the whole way over and sit down. As soon as they sit down, he slides right over and kneels right in front of her on a knee. And he says, hey. And you couldn't hear him, but I know Todd. He's fine. <laughs> Your friends are all. It's so a lady's fourth surgery. They've all botched. She can barely function. And they said, are you up for getting out of the house? Can we take you to eat? Can we just be like old times? Can you endure the pain? Can we just get you to a restaurant, get some air, and just sit and just be friends? Would you be able to handle it? I want to do that. I'm done just sitting in botched surgeries, pain, cooped in the house. Let's go. So bless her heart. She was trooping, trooper, you know. She's going. Todd's sitting, talking. He starts crying. He's so awesome with people because he loves. He's not trying to perform, produce anything. He is oblivious to everything around him. And he's just locked in on her. And I'm watching. It is priceless. And all of a sudden, he starts praying. And her friends are crying because they love her. And all of a sudden, he takes her hands and says, Come on. And she stands. He starts walking backwards. She said. And then he lets her hands go and he runs from here to the pillar. In Chili's. People are all over the place. The girls are bawling. Her girlfriends are bawling. He runs back. She's way up there. 
Come on. She goes. He says, that's Jesus. That's my Jesus. Thank you for not turning me away. Thank you for not scorning me. Thank you for saying yes. Thank you for letting me pray. He doesn't know he's in Chili's. <laughs> It was crazy good. Her friends, you have no idea. I looked over at the, the kitchen. Every waitress, heads lined up, and cooks lined up. What is going on? He says, Jesus just healed her. I don't know her, but Jesus, no, he healed her. And everybody's like, It blew up everything. So much for dinner. <laughs> so we sit down. You can't recover. He comes over. He's just sitting there looking across at me going, dude, dude, dude. That's the thing he imparted into my life, dude. He came to me suicidal. He said, can I talk to somebody? I said, I'll talk to you, man. Is that all right? He said, please. We went upstairs. I talked to him for a long time. He told me enough. How, how much do you have to explain about 22 years of drug addiction? I don't need to hear all the horror in the hell. I get the point. So he's trying to tell me all the hell, and I'm cutting him off. And I'm saying, listen, man, I get that. Listen. He's like, dude, you're not even listening to me, man. Like, dude, you're not even hearing where I've been and what I've done. You're not listening. And I said, dude. <laughs> I did. Dude. Probably my first time. <laughs> I said, you're not listening to where he's been and what he's done. And here's the problem. You think where you've been and what you've done is who you are. But where he's been and what he's done is the real you. Now, please listen. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he just started to cry and said, okay. <laughs> and shared the finished work because his identity is wrapped in drug addiction. I see him through Jesus Christ. You got to make that switch with people. And you got to sow the most vital seed that's ever been sown in their life. And then I watch him in Chile. live in the finished product of that investment. What a fun day. I don't know what we're doing. Sit out still? Yeah? No, you're good. Um, yeah, you're free. Be free. Um, okay, here was, here's one. Um, Are we just going to keep doing questions? You know, we'll, we'll do another I'm maybe. I'm so fired up. I don't know if it's safe. <laughs> just flame everybody, okay? They, they thought they could wear me out today. It's hilarious. I'm like, the more we preach and talk Jesus, I'm going to be bonkers. Like, we danced for 20 minutes. Yeah, wasn't that so yeah. good? Thank you, guys. That was so that good. That was so fun. I saw my wife take off her heels and she started jumping. I was like, "These things are getting serious down here." Woo! Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do two or three more questions. Okay, I'm fine. All right. Okay, good. All right, this one's good. I'm seeing more and more people getting healed than have been, I think. But then, you know, recently in the few months, weeks, years later, sometimes the same illness or infirmity comes back. How do I minister to those people in those situations, and how can I really like just love them in that? Always teach people relationship with Jesus. Always teach them what you believe the will of God is and why you ask to pray once you have access to them. If they get healed, you have total access to them. You'll be able to talk to them, right? Encourage them. There's, there's something, too, that I probably don't teach enough. A long time ago, I got this thought in my heart that, wait a minute. I don't believe Jesus prayed for the people in the city and they got healed and two weeks later it came back. I just feel there's something we need to grow in and walk in and understand there's an increased authority. And, and Jesus, like, rebuked infirmity and said, don't ever come back. 
And that's the way I've prayed in a lot of situations. And I'm actually in faith that it won't come back. I don't want to make a theology out of this. It's just an observation. I could probably count on one hand the people in the streets and unbelievers I prayed for that I found out it came back once I got to see them again or stayed in touch with them, whatever level that was. It seems like when it happens, it's a Christian a lot of times. So then we say, well, Christians are accountable because they honor, honor the word and da-da-da. And I get what we're trying to say. I teach people relationship. I teach them that, listen, if that thing would ever try to show its face again or whatever, ever, man, don't you say, oh, man, bummer, I thought I was healed. Wonder what I did wrong. Wonder what's happened. Don't get in a quandary. Father, I thank you for your love for me. You delivered me from this thing. You took away every pain. Ecclesiastes 3.13, what the Lord does lasts forever. No one takes away and no one adds. And the Lord does it that men might fear before him. I thank you, God, what you did, you did. Body, you be whole, you line up. Pain, you get out in Jesus' name. And all of a sudden, you're exercising relationship and authority and walking in the same thing that person walked in when they prayed for you and you got healed. And you want to teach yourself that relationship and that authority. You follow me? Or you got something to... I got like a yeah, hand over can there we get, going can like we get this. The... I thought he was like... <laughs> can we get that mic on real quick? Uh, or you can grab this one, whatever. So in the word it says uh, greater works, Jesus told greater works, will you do, who, is there people doing greater works nowadays? Like what are those greater works and have you seen those greater works? I, I'm interested in knowing that. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not totally sure. I've heard it preached a lot of different ways. I, I, I'm not prepared to say I have the super strong conviction on greater works in the sense of greater in quality, greater in quantity. I just know this, he lives in as many as would believe. We can cover ground that Jesus couldn't cover. We could do so many things in his name, greater works. I mean, how do you do greater than raised from the dead? How do you do greater than the things Jesus did? I'm not sure he was talking about greater works that way. Uh, I'm not sure that he was. And when you look it up and study it out, it's complexing a little bit. I know this, that Jesus said it wouldn't be profitable if I didn't go because he wouldn't come, the helper. And Jesus knew it would be greater for him to go than to stay so the helper could come. And this is what he did. Jesus multiplied himself in as many as would believe. When he was here, they had to throng him. Now that he's with the Father, Holy Spirit to us, nobody should have to throng one person. We're the body of Christ. Greater works shall we do because I go to the Father. What's he saying? Alos, the Greek, the same spirit, the same kind as has come to be your helper. And you'll do the things I do if you believe. And he'll do in my absence what I would do if I was here myself. So he's made us a priesthood of believer. So when Jesus was here in the flesh, he could pray for everybody in Capernaum. And they could get healed. Now we could pray for everybody wherever we are. Jesus is at one place, we're everywhere, and he's in us. It's greater works. Because I go to my Father. That's why I believe he means it that way. Because he said, if I don't go, he won't come, the helper won't come. Greater works because I go to my Father. What's he saying? I've put my spirit in as many as would believe because I'm interceding at the right hand of God and my blood is speaking mercy over you and better things and mercy is tried up over judgment and the same spirit that raised me from the dead now lives in you. Go be my disciples. Greater work, shall you? Yeah? That's just how I see it. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say something real quick. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting really stirred up by this guy. Um, if you look at the original Greek... For that word greater, it's my son. It just means more. So we realize like Jesus never even left Israel. So more will we do. We have, we have we'll accessibility do to so much now that we can do more. Not better, yeah. we can just do more. Right. Does that make sense? See, some people interpret the more as, as greater in the sense of the magnitude. I think he's talking about more. Because there's many of us. That's what yeah. I believe. Yeah. And... Sorry, you, we were hitting on original question. The original question was family or, or actually, no. Oh, yeah, no, we, yeah, moved, we moved past that. No, the, the question was, uh, it was about people and 
sickness coming back and whatnot. Yeah, but there was a question, even family. I don't know that I got so like into this one topic, but I just want to encourage whoever asked that question. Don't feel compelled to change your family or you'll come across wrong. Your words will hit, they'll fall to the ground. You become a living epistle. You get solid. You get complete, secure. And, and, and there's a time where in my own family, if things would get into gossip and stuff, because I've been saved now for 22 years, so I might have a little different voice in that situation in my family than you have in yours. They might just be still trying to figure you out. My family understands that, you know. So anyway, what I'm saying is there might be a time where I would just interject in a very soft way. Or I might walk out of the room and, and then come right back. And they, they know, they're like, they're aware they're talking about so-and-so and it's not good. And I say, listen, guys, man, I don't want to see him self-righteous or presumptuous, but we're doing no good to so-and-so just sitting here talking. And you're going to get trapped. We're going to all get trapped. Pride, self-righteousness, judgment. Why? Don't. No. Stop. I'll talk. I'm that frank. Because I just believe I can do that if my heart's right. See what I mean? That sure beats you walking in another room grieved and crying or crying all day saying Holy Spirit's grieved. No, you're grieved. Holy Spirit's a little bigger than crying all day because they did something. <laughs> Don't you put that on Holy Spirit. I've seen intercessors get trapped in that. The pastor gets up and stops things right in the middle of worship and they cry all afternoon and say, Holy Spirit's so grieved he cried in me all day. No, you cried because your expectations in intercession got failed and unfulfilled and you're spiritualizing it. Holy Spirit's a little bigger than pastor cutting the worship short and him crying all day. It's not happening. Are you guys okay? <laughs> Let's just stop spiritualizing it. We're messing that up really bad. Holy Spirit's a little more solid than crying all day because pastor stepped up a minute early. <laughs> okay, That's I'm good. sorry. And back to that original question of, um, isn't this so good? I feel like I'm imagining just like this fire behind us and we're in our pajamas with hot chocolate and this is just family time. <laughs> it, come on, that's Where the kingdom. Where did he come from? Uh, so heaven, good. heaven. Um, <laughs> back to that question of, uh, about, you know, things coming back. I remember one day being in my car and uh, ever since I've been saved, it's been seven, seven years now. I've never had to deal with like fear or worry or anxiety or anything. And I remember driving down the street and the just fear just gripped me out of nowhere. And it wasn't nothing about, hey, the cancer or sickness or you're going to die or Katie's going to die. It just fear came against me. And I was like, wow, that's really weird. Like I never, I never deal with fear. And this thought came, this thought came against me, okay? I just want you to hear me clear. It came against me and it said, you, you do have fear. And, like you're just, having, you're just not dealing with it. And then I immediately heard the Holy Spirit say, Joey, you don't have fear. You're experiencing it. And, and for me, that was a huge revelation because a lot of times, like people do get healed of tension headaches or back pain or whatever it is. And then these experiences come back upon them and they believe, well, did God really heal me? I don't know if I'm really healed. And the Holy Spirit showed me like sometimes that thing will just come back and, and it's trying to get back in the house, but you're just experiencing it. You don't own it anymore. It's not a part of you. It's just an experience that you're having but don't let it define the experience that you're having, you know, with him and what he's done. Does that make sense? Okay. Sorry. I just wanted to share that. Um, this isn't even my Q&A. What am I doing? Uh, okay. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Here's a question, and I feel like it's a loaded question, but it's really simple. How do we grow in faith? Wow. That was a serious question, by the way. That no, it was. was. Well, obviously, the Bible says faith comes by hearing, by the hearing and hearing by the word. Faith, uh, faith works through love. I've taught this for years. I believe this with all my heart. Faith is the spontaneous result of knowing Him. Faith flows out of your relationship. When you know who He is and you understand His will in a situation, faith is the spontaneous result of knowing Him. You grow in knowing Him and knowing His nature and knowing His will. Faith is an automatic response. You're not trying to have faith. If you're trying to have faith, you don't. Did you get that? Faith is the spontaneous result of knowing Him. Faith works through love. Faith doesn't work because you have a need. Faith works because you have a covenant and you know the God of that covenant. 
Faith doesn't work because you have a crisis. Faith works because you know him. You guys with me? That, I believe, is how you build faith. Get closer to God and have a relationship and get to know him. Amen? Listen carefully. Ministry's awesome. Going on a mission trip's great. All that stuff's great. Uh, Going to Africa, the testimonies, the blind, all that stuff. Man, that's exciting, and I'm not making light of it. It's all great. But nothing compares to your ability to be with him. And that's the highest honor of everything we get to do. Because everything that he does through us should flow from that holy place. In Mark 3, 13, he says he ordained them, or he called them to himself who he himself wanted, and they came. Nobody comes unless he's drawn. That's what's happened to us. He's called us, he's drawn us, and we came. And it says he ordained them. Whoa, ordination. Appointed. He ordained them that they might be with him. And that he might send them out to preach, heal, and do mighty things in his name. What did he ordain them to do? Be with him. Where does he send them from? Being with him. Don't do ministry if you're not with him. Don't even go if you're not with him. Being with him is what sends you. Or you'll let what you're doing for God take the place of knowing God and your identity will be wrapped in ministry. And you won't do well. And you'll crash at some point. Just being raw and honest. Nothing compares to your ability given by God to be with him. And the only person that can keep you from that place is you believe in wrong thing. Because he paid the price to open the door and give you access. You're the only one that can keep you from his presence. Because you're invited. The only thing is wrong thinking and wrong believing. No one can keep me from knowing him but me. You can turn against me. You can all get mad at me. You can write terrible things. You can call me anything you want. And you cannot keep me from his presence. You cannot keep me from hearing his voice tonight laying quiet on the bed. You can't keep me from waking up in him and knowing him in the morning. I'm the only one that can keep me from him. That's really good. Okay, so last two questions. Okay, guys, so uh, we're going to do one more phone and one more audience. So I'm going to hit the phone one. Uh, It's kind of a loaded question. What are your thoughts on suffering for the gospel? Suffering for the gospel, simple persecution and sacrifice in the flesh and the natural. has nothing to do with sickness, nothing to do with disease. You don't see Jesus sick. The sufferings of Jesus aren't sickness. Jesus wasn't sick. He was misunderstood, he was judged, he was gossiped on, he was mistreated, he was hated, he was persecuted. The sufferings of the gospel is whatever it cost you living in the light in the midst of darkness. Living in the truth in the midst of misunderstanding and lies. And if they hated him, they'll hate you. Don't take it personal and don't provoke them to hate you to fulfill scripture. It says as much as depends on you, Be at peace with all men. Yeah? So the suffering for the gospel is simple that way. Simple. It's not sickness. It's not disease. It's not poverty. It's people not understanding you in the midst of perversion. It's people not believing. It's people coming against you for what you stand for. It's it's the... It's whatever being like him costs you in relationships, family. He said, you think I came to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. And there'll be five in a household and three against two and two against three. A mother against a daughter and a father against a son. 
That's amazing scripture language. That's called the suffering of the gospel. Not everybody seeing what you see, believing what you believe, excited about what you're excited about. Falsely accusing you, thinking you're in a call, brainwashed, and not receiving true change in your life. There's a price in all that. Don't take it personal. Paul said, all I know is this. There's chains and persecutions waiting me everywhere I go. That's what Holy Spirit's telling me. <laughs> he says, but I'm going because I don't count my own life dear so I can fulfill the will of him who called me. That's a far cry from him pleading for God to remove that thorn from his flesh. Because that thing buffeted him constantly. What's he talking about? Sickness? Are you kidding me? Nothing to do with sickness. How do you know it's not sickness, the thorn? It's simple, the word. Did God promise you healing? Is there healings concerning, promise concerning healing? So Paul couldn't have been sick. Paul can't be asking God to remove something he promised he would and then God jerk authority on him and say, listen, man, I'm God, you're not. My grace is sufficient for you. I know I promise, but hey. If you taught your child, if you treated your child like that one time, you've done damage. You do it twice, you taught him to never take you at your word. Of course the devil loves us to believe the thorn is sickness because you can never take God at his word. Did God promise Paul suffering for his namesake? Then what do you think the thorn was? Every time he opened his mouth, he got beat, whipped, stoned, and battered. And he said, God, would you please take this thing from me? He said, I told you the things you must suffer for my namesake. My grace is sufficient for you. Just keep preaching the gospel. I got you covered, boy. He wasn't talking about sickness. That would be you promising your child, hey, I want to teach you responsibility and family. Without asking, I want you to take the garbage out every Tuesday. And please keep your room redded up. And when I come in, I don't want to see clothes just strewn everywhere. You got a wash basket in there. Make sure they're in there. Make it easy for mom. When it gets to a point where you're needing some clothes, take it down and sit at mom's well able and willing to help and clean and wash, but do your part, function as family. Man, tell you what, you do that faithfully for the next six weeks, and I'll take you over to here. Serious, Dad? You'll take me there? That's my favorite place. I know. I want to reward you and treat you right and teach you that if you'll continue to do the things that are right, there's a reward in that. There's a blessing. Not spoiling you, not... I just want to teach you this is important, and it pays a great price in dividends. Six weeks goes by and your son's all proud and he says, Dad, did you realize I this? Did you realize that? Man, let's go. When are you taking me there? You said you'd take me there. Yeah, I know I said it, but you know what? Man, I've changed my mind. Listen, I know you might not understand this, but I'm your dad and you're my son and you need to understand I'm in authority. I've just changed my mind. I think it's in your best interest. Just keep doing what I ask you to do. Let's cut out the reward for a minute and you just stay faithful. But Dad, you said six weeks. and I, I know, but son, stop. I'm Dad. You're not, and I'm making this choice. You do that one more time to your child, and they'll never be able to take you at your word. How many people don't take God at his word? Because they don't believe he's faithful to his promise. They actually believe Paul was sick, and that Paul prayed, and God said, my grace is sufficient. Well, great, thanks for your grace, but what about your promise? And you magnified your word above your own name, and the integrity of your name is wrapped in your word. And I'm not being sarcastic. I'm saying Paul could have thought that. We could have thought that. But God, you said you forgive all my sin and heal all my disease. You didn't say your grace is sufficient. You said ask anything believing it shall be done. You said if I say the mountain, it'll move. You didn't say nothing about your grace being sufficient and not doing it. You said you would. You're faithful. That's how you know what Paul's thorn was, because the word tells you. Paul's asking God to remove something he promised he'd experience. And it wasn't sickness. It was suffering for his name. You get it? Look up the word buffeting. It means blows to the flesh. 
Look up the word infirmity. It's not sickness. It means weakness. That's good. Okay, that's really good, actually. That's a lot to chew on. We have one. We're going to do one or two more audience questions, just depending on time. Uh, you said one or two two times ago. I am, you must be having fun. I should. I know my yes is not being my yes. I'm really sorry. Uh, I saw you first, so you just want to stand. Could you run this to her? Hi. <laughs> I'm Ashley. Nice to meet you. <laughs> okay, this is my question that I texted. Um, how am I sinless and also sinful? How do I reconcile that I am a saint who also chooses to sin? Like I have lustful and selfish thoughts and actions, etc. Isn't this a both and situation? That I am both a saint and made perfect. All, uh, also being made perfect and being sanctified. It's a process. Um, while, we, while we are in this body of flesh, I find that I still wage war. How do I make sense of the tension that we live in? How yeah. many questions was that? <laughs> and then I guess I just kind of want to add, like, is it really... Do you have it written? I did. I'll, I'll resend it. <laughs> no, no, no. If it's there, I'll just read it. Because I want to be able to really answer your question. Because we can answer that question in the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Technology. Hold on, I just want to add one thing to that. Uh -huh. What? My, my last little add-on is, after you answer that, is, is it really as simple is it really, is it really it's as really simple, simple as it's really just simple. believing, like, um, like when I, so. It's really simple. It's in perspective. I'm going to teach it out to you, okay? Okay. Okay. Because I also. Stop <laughs> asking questions. Let me answer the ones you already asked. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Get the mic out of her hand. Yeah. Wow, I'm reading the question above yours. <laughs> yeah, I think this is going to be our last question for the night, okay? I'm sorry, it's got to be. Wow. I just want to love the person that wrote the question above hers and then I'll answer hers. Can we do hers and theirs? Say it again. Said he's talking about deliverance, but what about inner healing? Are, oh, yeah, we not, yeah. are we not believing truth if we have wounds that need healing or counsel, etc.? Was that yours? Here's <laughs> something else, girl. That's awesome. So compassion towards you. God's like drawing my eye to that question. Yeah, faith takes care of everything. It's what Brandon said. What about faith? You know, inner healing always takes you back to yesterday and always makes you a product of what happened and how you responded, how you reacted. It's usually connected to degenerate emotions, emotions that stem from self-centeredness, the ability to be hurt, broken, offended. So it's like sometimes we're just looking for an inner peace feeling in the midst of trauma, and we call that healing. But if we don't take that foundation away, you'll experience those things again and again and again. And then you'll get trapped living by feelings. I'm personally... Oh, man, am I saying this? I'm personally not a fan of inner healing. I, I feel like we run a risk of doing more harm than good. I feel like we're teaching people sensuality at the cost of faith in a lot of cases. And I'm not saying it's all bad, and I'm not saying nobody's ever been helped. I just think we run a lot more risks than we're benefiting from. That's all I'm saying. Okay, and your phone is buzzing, dude. It's like bzz, 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 questions must be pouring in. How am I sinless and also sinful? How do I reconcile that I am a saint who also chooses to sin almost daily? Okay, now we know you asked that question, so you asked that question. Listen, you don't want to choose to sin almost daily. That should be a concern. No one should want to all choose to sin daily. Your life gets sanctified through truth. You recognize what sin is through his word and communion with his spirit. So to choose to sin daily, that's something you want to 
you want to you address and you want to say, okay, where am I choosing to sin daily? What does that really mean? And what am I doing that's sinful? And you got to recognize, wait a minute, my life is more than this. I'm called to shine. I'm called to be in fellowship with God. I am not subject to some dual nature that's driving me through life in a helpless manner. we got to throw that lie out, man. You're not fighting something like that. No, you, you're filled with Christ. Who shall save me from this bondage, from this burden, from this man? Oh, 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 how does he say it? In, in, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this bondage of death, man, and bondage of lies and stuff? Thank God through Jesus Christ. Man, so, so here's what you want to do. You, you don't want to see yourself as sinful. You don't want to take the tendency to sin and mark yourself as sinful. You want to realize that God sanctified you and called you out of darkness into the light. So the central desire to sin comes from a self-centered, selfish nature. And he who has died is free from sin. You get what I'm saying? So you got to say, oh my goodness, God, thank you that I'm not in a war anymore. You've sanctified me and set me free. If there's anything contrary to truth that rises up in me, that tries to drive me in an unprofitable manner, I thank you, God, I have an answer. I'm more than that. Who you are in me is greater. You didn't create me for this. I'm not here to suffice my flesh for a moment and pay a price in my soul later. No, you even said Moses in an old covenant separated himself when he became accountable from the passing pleasures of sin. Right? And made himself a member of the body of Christ and choose to suffer the afflictions of, of Pharaoh and didn't fear him and all that good stuff. Man, I don't want you, honey, to believe that you're set up and subject to fail every day then you willfully sin every day. You don't want that. It says, if we go on sinning willfully after the knowledge of truth, we're making nothing of his grace. We're insulting the blood of Jesus Christ. We're like saying it's not sufficient. You got to be careful with that and, and you want to get a grip on your life where those things are pulling you so if you're just well I probably taught this out earlier if your addictive behaviors and compulsions and little vices in people's lives are almost verbatim always attached to a low esteem and a less than truth identity about the person's self about their they have a low view of themselves, so they live up to the low level in which they see themselves. Most addictions and most vices are attached to a low esteem and a crushed identity. When a person sees who he is, they live up to what they see. If you can teach somebody that's addicted, Todd would call me, I fell into drugs. He's crying so hard. I'm like, okay, listen, man. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you felt this way using? And when's the last time you cried and felt sincerely sorry? And then he really cried. I said, dude, your heart's changing. Your life's changing. I said, here's the problem. You're going to think because you used, you're still a user. You're caring, man. The gospel's changing your life. Don't you let what you did start defining you. Let what he did continue to grow you because this thing's about to break off of you because you're being changed. You care about something. You care about something you never cared about. The last time you used, you were already deciding how you were going to use again. Now you used and you're calling me broken. This isn't you. This is a tendency. And as your identity gets solid and you grow and your identity gets restored, this thing's going to break off of you, man. So most pastors say, you can't do that. You can't go to it. What did you do? You can't do that. That's a contradiction. That's hypocrisy. That's... You can't tell a man to change. You teach a man to change. You show him who he is. And who he is overcomes the desire. Who he really is overcomes the action. Come on, you better learn to counsel in faith and trust the gospels enough. You better teach people who they are so that they have the firepower to see clear and make the tree good so the fruit can change. So how can I be free from sin and still sinful? I don't identify myself through any nature or passion or ten temptation to go into something that I'm not in Christ. So if I'm living my life today as Dan Moeller, as you know me, and all of a sudden something tries to rub me wrong and I feel tempted to get hurt by what something somebody said, I don't consider that sinful, honey. I consider that a temptation to fall into what I was delivered from. And I say, no, the knowledge in my life shows me that's never an option. God, I am so 
so much more than getting offended by what they just did. That tried to catch me off guard and actually justify some feelings and emotions that aren't your heart. And God, I thank you that you're greater in me and you protect me with truth. And Father, I am not offended. And God, I thank you that next thing you know, you're back in this good, solid place. It's what he said. Sometimes we think because we experienced it, it's who we are. If it violates you, it's a sign it's not you. If you care about what you're thinking and wish you didn't think it anymore, you're not conjuring it up, people. So stop taking responsibility and repenting for something you're not. Why don't you lift your hands and thank God, right? I tell the story all the time. I was in a worship service. I, didn't, I was never addicted to pornography. It was just around me a lot. It was at work all the time. It was magazines laying open on the table. The bosses would stop and read them. But one time I watched this video, and it was only probably twice in my whole life I watched a porn video in my whole life. And, but I watched this video. Now I'm born again years later, and I'm in a worship service. Worship was amazing. It was a holy atmosphere. And I'm just standing there, God, you're so good. You're just here, man. This is, and I'm going to preach. I'm Pastor Dan. I'm supposed to teach a ministry school in a minute. And while I'm standing there in the presence of God, worshiping the Lord, this video ran through my mind from years ago, like I'm watching it right now. Bizarre, isn't it? You know what that thing's doing? looking for an opportune time, trying to get me to take responsibility for something I'm not. The last thing I want to see is that video. The last thing on my mind is that video. The last thing I'm entertained by is that video. When I saw that video, it's disgusting and defiling to, defiling to me. And if I could go back and erase that I watched it, I would. I didn't conjure that. Here's what the devil's doing. He's trying to get me insecure and try to get me to think because I thought it and pictured it that it's me, and now I'm ready to preach. It's trying to get me to repent for something I'm not, get insecure, throw away the anointing, gifting, and calling, and cry at the altar and say, God, I can't believe this defilement is in my mind, this wretched trash. I thought my mind was sanctified. I don't know why, God, this stuff's going through me. I am so, so, so sorry. God, I don't want this junk in my life. God, help me, help me, help me. Have mercy. I'm not going to do that. I didn't think it up. Guess what I did? The worship was so ridiculously good, I blew the atmosphere up, man. Dude, I'm sorry. Like, the, the, the keys were tinkering. Nobody was talking. People were weeping. Nobody wanted to move. You know what I'm saying. And now you just touched me wrong. This is war. And my weapon isn't fighting the devil. My weapon's truth. So I'm standing there, and this picture goes through my head, and I'm watching this movie in my mind, like, and it wouldn't go away. The mind's a tricky thing. If I say right now, I don't want any of you, none of you, right now, none of you, don't you dare think about an elephant, it's forbidden. You already saw one. It's suggestion. Stop calling it sin. It's not you. If you care about it, if you feel bad, it's not you. So I'm standing there, God, I worship you. Boom, video. I'd have scared you if you were standing near me. Father, I thank you I'm changed forever. I thank you you've sanctified my mind and my life and my heart. God, I worship you and thank you that you made me a new creation. People were going, whoa, I don't know what's going on with Dan, but that is not the atmosphere right now. <laughs> You're going to touch me like that? I'm freaking out in truth. <laughs> I am not going to cry and repent for something that's not in my heart. I'm not going to attach it to me and say that I'm sinful and got wicked thoughts in my mind and I need deliverance. And some pastor's up there preaching, well, if your mind would be exposed on that board, would you be proud of that? Da -da. That's not good teaching because not everything going through people's minds is coming from their heart. And you know the difference. You know if you're dwelling on that thing and conjuring it and, and playing it. Or you know if it caught you off guard and you wish you weren't seeing it. You know. Don't you call that sin. And I just went ballistic. Father, and I just worship you and thank you for new life through Jesus Christ. I thank you I'm holy and blameless and above reproach in your sight. You've touched me. You've changed me. You love me. Ah! And guess what people started doing? Well, we love Dan. We respect Dan. 
He's in the groove. I guess we'll join in and have some confession. God, we thank you. We appreciate you. We love you. And I'm like, and it was just funny, man. So I come out of that, and I'm like, whoa. And I turned. It's a ministry school. I'm teaching and training and equipping. Sometimes in that session and setting, you need to, to, to live it by example and show by example and demonstrate what you're teaching. So I said, listen, tonight we're talking about this and that and words of knowledge, impressions. And, and, and I said, sir, you right now, or it was a lady. I said, ma'am, I said, there's something on your right ankle. It's right under your ankle. It's a protrusion. It's a tumor type growth. It's a fatty thing. Whatever it is, it's concerned you. It's bothering you. If you'll feel it's gone. She went, ah! I said, sir, the middle of your back, herniated disc. I see it. I don't know the name. I just see it right. It's right in the center. I see a herniated disc. Is that true? Yeah. I said, right now, that heat that's going through you, making you whole. Check it in about 30 seconds. There's no pain. Bam, bam. Things just started to happen, right? Watch. I don't even think any of that would have happened if I didn't see the video. The video stirred me into something that took me deeper than I was even. And the video spurred me to him. And he said, I'll tell you what. I love you, Dan. You responded to me. Let's have some fun. I'm just going to blast some things and do some things. That video spurred me to a thing and released something in the room that might not even happen if I didn't see the video. How do you stop that kind of wisdom if we continue to believe? So here's my point. When I see the video, am I a man with a problem or am I a man with an answer? If you become a man with a problem, you have a problem. If you become a man with an answer, you have the manifestation of the kingdom. You get it? Okay. Can we just give a round of applause for Dan? Come on. Come on. Yeah, come on. We honor I him. I thank him. <laughs> I love you. Bless you guys. All right. Hey, I just want to... Before we take off, I just want to, you know, we obviously thank Dan, but thank you everyone for coming out. I know this weekend was heavy. I feel like if there's one word, it's just heavy, but a good heaviness. Uh, and just a reminder, tomorrow at Canyon Hills, it's 7001 Auburn Street at 1.30. We're going to have Dan for one more session, okay? So, uh, yeah, PJ, you want to get up here and share? And, and also... In the morning, if you guys are sticking around for Dan, we invite you to come be our guest. We have Dr. John Easter. He's like the lead strategist for Africa, uh, really f kind of, kind of uh, for the global mission initiative for a lot of churches and a lot of streams that are pushing into Africa. So we invite you to come, and their service is at 8, 10, 11, and 12, and then you can catch Dan at 1.30. And if you want to come back, be our guest here tomorrow night for Chris Q. Um, I just wanted to make mention of that. Hey, let's just do this real quick. Can we just, let's just open our hands. Let's just pray this out, okay? I know it's the last time at City Center, and I know some of you won't be able to make it to any of that. But um, if you can't, let's just pray. And let's just, um, yeah, Father, we just thank you for truth. We thank you, Jesus, that, um, that you're perfect theology, Lord. And if our life doesn't line up to what you've taught us or the standard that you've put out, Lord, we just, we're just going to be patient, and we're going to let you teach us and mold us in your image. And we thank you for all the seeds sown this weekend, Lord. I just declare that none of it would be robbed. None of it would fall to hard ground. None of it would fall with the wayside or in the thorns and be choked out. Lord, I just declare that you've, you've tilled the soil, that you, you, <laughs> you've gotten rid of all the hardness this weekend. So we just declare that the soil is ready for all that seed to go down and just birth fruit. And I thank you, Lord, that, that we're, we get to take this and whatever you're doing into our communities, into our workplaces, and even back to our churches, Lord. And I just thank you that love is going to be our goal. Love is going to be our motivation because it's yours. And so we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you guys for coming out. Hey, if you could just honor the house. If you see trash, would you just pick up a piece of trash and maybe throw it in a trash can and, and bless a few people on your way out. Love you guys.